Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Buckeye Huddle Post Game Live. Mark Givler here, Devin Radcliffe, Ohio State loses to Michigan third year in a row, 30 to 24. Kyle McCord's, uh, we'll call it desperation attempt there at the end to Marvin Harrison does not get there. Michigan interception, game over, uh, three in a row for Michigan. And a lot of the same things that have crippled Ohio State and some of these big games over the years reared their head again today. Devin, where do we start with uh, with today's game? And just uh, a roller coaster, I think, if you're an Ohio or a Michigan fan, to be to be frank, uh, just a roller coaster. Just momentum swings. Michigan early, Ohio State middle, then Michigan again, then Ohio State toward the end. I, I think this starts. Everyone's going to go nuts on McCord for the uh, early interception, the late interception. Let's talk about the defense, though. Zero stops in the second half. Not one stop. I think the first thing we need to start with is that this is the post-mortem show, uh, if you want to be more appropriate, uh, the feeling of Ohio State fans right after this ball game. Um, and, again, I think you're exactly right. Uh, it's a great place to start. Um, you know, and I think the big thing that manifested itself today is something I, I've been concerned about throughout the year is the inability to create negative plays on a consistent basis where you want to get the offense behind the sticks. And, and like you said, we saw it there in the second half where uh, even though the defense didn't give up the big plays, kept things underneath, made them earn it, uh, which are all good things. However, they there was an inability to get off the field there in the second half, even though they held them to field goals you still did not create that opportunity to get the offense back on the field and w with the stop. And, uh, and it was a different, you know, big factor in the ball game today. This was like this fourth quarter was the ant. It was, it was the same kind of result where you're looking back on why the defense couldn't just come up with some stops, but it was almost opposite last year against Georgia. They needed to make Georgia drive the field. Instead, they gave up that one one play drive, basically, where, where the game's right back, you know, as a toss-up game. Today was different. They would have been better off giving up a, a 30, 40, 50-yard play, holding Michigan to a field goal on a three-minute drive. Instead, they let them drive seven minutes and kick the field goal. You've got no timeouts left. you got a minute left. You get into range, but again, last play, uh, come up empty. Why? Why are these things continuing to happen? To the, I mean, this is this is now two years in a row where a lot of people give Jim Knowles praise that the defense has been fixed and things are better and different, and yet here we are again, wondering why the defense couldn't get a single stop in the second half. Uh, I can't remember who said it during the uh, during during this the. the uh, if it was Gus Johnson or Joel Klatt there, uh, or the or the big the big noon crew there, but they, they made a point about halftime adjustments. We didn't really see at least not not at first glance major adjustments from the defense in the second half. Uh, and to be fair, you know, first half it wasn't terrible. They played some good ball. Uh, you know, we'll get to it. But again, there was a there was basically a uh, I don't want to call it a pick six, but you know, short field interception. You can't you can't discount that. However, you've got to have that, and, I, and it's something I, I talk about. All right, what is my what's my stopper call here? All right, how am I going to get this team get this team off the field? And I, and I don't know. Again, this first time through, um, you know, I don't know if we saw that attempt uh, uh, by Knowles with that in game feel. You know, I think early in the game we saw a five man pressure that uh, tight end got loose on the middle of the field on for you know 15, 20 yard gain. Uh, didn't bite him, but they got him on the ground. But again, I don't, we didn't really see that. All right, you know what? We've got two minutes left. We got to get the ball back. What are we going to do to get them off the field? Type call. And again, in the ultimate irony, where sending the house last year was what did them in. You know, the cruel football gods, uh, master, masters of the football universe. There may have been a good time this year, actually. You know, it, it was to let them rip and and send the house and see if you can't create that big play for the defense. Yeah, it's just kind of it's it's just what I said a few minutes ago. What you just said. The situ situational awareness. Um, again, last year a last year in the Peach Bowl, a eight play, seventy five yard drive that took five minutes would have actually been just fine. Ohio State probably wins that game. 
this year, I I mean, this you would have been better off giving up a one play 75 yard touchdown with eight minutes to go, going down 10, than you would have been to let them drive seven minutes and give you the ball back with a minute to go and no timeouts needing a touchdown. Um, so the situational awareness and the calls you have to make in those situations just seem completely backwards for the second straight year in a, in a huge game. And so there's going to be a lot of questions there. And I agree with you. The defense, the defense actually played very well in the first half. Um, you know, you don't blame them at all for the touchdown. That, that was a bad throw by McCord, um, a bad decision by McCord. And so you're, you're put in a hole there. You give up the touchdown. They had to go for it on fourth down. I mean, you really made them have to, you know, earn those seven yards or whatever it was. Um, you know, you gave up a, another touchdown drive, but you know, that's going to happen eventually. You're not going to pitch a shutout in this one, but, uh, you know, it's, it's the second year in a row we're having these issues that we're talking about with the defense. And, you know, that wasn't the only thing today, obviously, but, you know, again, full stop, like zero stops in the second half, full stop. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Again, the difference this year to last year is they're holding them to field goals. However, you know, we do, we just discussed it. At some point, you've got to be able to create that negative play, get the ball back to your offense. And again, it's game adjustments, game awareness, feel the game, if you will. Um, heck, we can even go into the box first field uh, debate about where Noel should be calling the game from uh, if we really want to get lost in the weeds. But uh, it, it definitely just had a weird, uh, uh, you know, it's knowing your opponent. You know, Michigan is just is happy to take old school three and a half yards and just grind you out, which they did successfully today. Uh, where again, contrast that with Georgia was looking to hit some of those big plays. So you got to know your opponent and, and be able to adjust accordingly. And they, you know, the guys at the halftime uh, on the broadcast did talk about that. And I think that was the difference in the ball game there. Uh, uh, it was the second half adjustments by both teams or lack of, if you want to, if you want to go that route. Yeah. Um, again, just the, the situational awareness is, is really kind of stunning. Uh, but they, they couldn't get Michigan off schedule either, like at all in the second half. It, it felt like every every set of downs was a Blake Corum or a Donovan Edwards. And it wasn't like a 12-yard run, but it was a four or five-yard run. Now you're in second and five, and you can do whatever you want. You, your entire playbook is open to you. And they never got Michigan off schedule in the second half. And I think that was, you know, it's, it's, it's harder, to, obviously, as a defensive coordinator to, to make calls on second and five than it is on second and nine. But that's when you have to make better calls on first and 10. Maybe try some run blitzes. Maybe maybe you do load the box. Because again, you you can, if you give up a chunk play, but you can still hold to a field goal, now your team has the ball back with five minutes left, six minutes left. That's okay. Uh, I, just, I just, the situational awareness was uh, just awful again. And you, know, um, you want to look at matchups too, uh, yeah. con- contrasting the two years. Um, you know, I, I, you know, obviously don't have the stat statistical breakdown of the game, but I think by and large, uh, Denzel Burke, uh, and Davidson, Ing- 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 you're going to tell me on it, Ingvin, 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 <laughs> sorry, I still can't get it right. Uh, you know, they played best I could tell they played about lights out. I don't remember them, uh, uh, you know, really having, having, having good games, I guess you could say. And, you know, in, in the ultimate, ultimate twist, you know, they, from last year where the big plays were given up by the corners there, trust your guys, you know, load the box up to your point and see if you can't get that safety blitz run through on first and 10 to turn it into second 13 uh, to try and get them off the schedule and create those negative plays. I want to save the middle point here for last McCord turnovers. You, you can't continually lose the turnover battle um, in this game. The second one is what it is. I mean, people are going to freak out about the second one, but you have twenty, you have twenty-five seconds left. You have no timeouts, and you your offensive line has blown its protection. I mean, that's going to happen. But the first one just can't. The first one can't happen. And just like I said about Knowles here, where we're talking about the same kind of things, we're talking about the same kind of things again. Why can't this passing game? avoid this early like first 10 to 15 minute thing they go through once again their 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 offense makes a big mistake early 
puts the defense in bad situations early and it takes until, you know, the middle of the second quarter. And now all of a sudden they're moving up and down the field, but if you put yourself in a hole, what is the answer there? Because it's not like, Oh, we just can't throw the ball in the first quarter. You have to, you have to get something established, but why is this continually happening to them in the first quarter? You know, one thing I'm thinking of as, as you're talking about that, um, when you go back, not just this game, but Ryan Day's tenure, it seems like the first half he's a jabber. If you want to use a boxing analogy, he's throwing jabs, trying to fill you out. And then the second half, uh, again, oversimplified. And then the second half, he's ready to throw his combos to knock you out. What I think was missing this year in the past game is he didn't have a knockout punch. And here's Ryan Day. Even if he got hit, you know what would happen. Um, you know, you know, that looked like he got hit. Uh, hard to describe. Yeah. Um, you know, just sick. The fact that you know, um, you know, up short in this game, working the whole year for it, and um, you know, short. So, um, right next to Larry you were thinking early on, uh, not going for the pound, and at the end of the test, um, not trying to make a first down, um, you know, a clock rate. Um, yeah, well, uh, I, I felt like at 52 yards, um, it was worth the field goal there. If you, if you don't get it on, I think it was like fourth and two, fourth and three, somewhere in there, uh, you had no points. And, you know, I felt like it was it was worth the opportunity to if we come up short there and just turn over and down. So, Felt like that was the right move, and then early in the game, midfield, um, just don't want to give them any momentum. Felt like we pinned them down and played defense. I thought we were playing pretty good early on. Over to the right, Austin Ward podcast. Looks like you went out here for the next issue on the Denzel day. Rowan Wilson, did you get one? What did they explain to you? Yeah, I was told that um, it was called on the field touchdown, and because of that, uh, um, uh, it was it was uh, held. Um, I didn't quite understand exactly how that was, but um, but that's what they said. Uh, Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch, trying to get the ball for what kind of eight minutes of the game. What, what was that? What was that? What was yeah, just take, um, did a nice run on the ball, and you know we ended up hanging on the end, giving it, it our offense a chance to win. But uh, too much off the clock there, we had to stop and get off the field. Clay Hall, WSYX. How would you rate Kyle's performance? I mean. 18, almost 300 yards. Decision making. I mean, and in this game, you got to win the rushing yards and you got to win the turnover battle. We did neither of those things. So, um, you know, uh, if we're not, that's not going to happen, we're not going to win this game. Uh, Dan, did you ever. Dan, let's tell you. I know. It's like, oh, this is huge. So much going on. What do you tell me? Yeah, I try to keep, um, oh, uh, what we'll talk about in the locker room to ourselves, but we're also pointed. Uh, we know that um, what this game means to so many people, and um, and so to come up short is certainly uh, not only uh, just because you invest your whole year in it, we know that's what this game means. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of room there that's devastated, and um, it wasn't my lack of effort, but. but Again, you know, we're in the turnover battle, so you're not going to win a game. So to close the door in the back uh, over here. I, I felt like um, I felt like you know, that that happens a lot, and in, in you know. Games like this, you kind of go back and forth a little bit in the second All half. Right, so that's we're gonna we're gonna get away from that. Uh, there must be some. I know we're having some Wi-Fi issues pregame as well, so I think it's just Wi-Fi issues. And um, we'll have the press conference up on the YouTube channel after the game, so we don't want to we don't want to make everyone suffer through that. <laughs> you can't even understand the questions and everything. So let's keep talking about the game here. Um, you know, Devin, I, we we kind of left it off with McCord's turnovers, especially that first one that puts you in the hole. Um, what pass, is past game? Pass yeah, game. yeah, and like just what what can be done here moving forward? Because it's 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 such a pattern now. Like this is not a one game or two game thing. It's not even a big game thing. It's like an every game, but like two games this year, they have come out 
slow out of the gates before and, and not really found their footing until, you know, maybe early to mid second quarter. And I just want to know what you think the, the answers are to that, that can change that. I mean, it's going to have to change next year and we can kind of get into some other stuff about the rest of this season, but what, how do you fix this? Oh, I, let me, let me finish my thought. I was, I was in yeah. the middle of there for coach Jay jumped on there. I think one of the things we saw the difference this year between years past is the past game. It seems like feet. This is a seems like feels like statement. So, you know, stat guys feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like Ryan day's always been jabbing. I was using a boxing analogy, right? He comes out early jabbing, trying to figure out what you're going to give him. And once he's figured that out, that's when you see the onslaught of points from, from a Ryan day offense uh, traditionally. Um, but he had dynamic wide receivers that could stretch the field, fast, explosive guys that can take it to the house. You can think of Laves, Wilsons, uh, Paris Campbells. I mean, he had some dynamic speed guys that, that were one-touch guys. Um, this year, if you look at McCourt's numbers, I mean, they talked about in this game, he started off – I can't remember where he started off. He started off two for ten or whatever it was. Well, and then Four for ten he started. Yeah. Four for ten, but then he went on a streak of like 12 for 12 or something like that. Uh, again, I don't remember the numbers exactly. So there it is again, where real start, real slow start, like you like you mentioned. McCord sees it, starts seeing it. They start figuring out what they're getting. What's the difference? They're not getting those huge chunk plays that we've been used to seeing with the Coach Day offense from uh, Alave taking a slant to the house or Wilson going over the top and doing Garrett Wilson things. Uh, you know, Paris Campbell taking a slant to the house. Um, just, just, just again, to use some easy examples there, we're not seeing that this year from the wide receiving core. Even from Marvin Harrison Jr., as, as great as he is, he is not a – I'm going to word this right so I don't so I don't get myself lit up on this one. I don't want to say he's not a huge play guy. He's not a, uh, I don't know, explosive. Uh, that's yeah, he's, he's not Curtis Samuel. He's not like yeah. throw him a bubble screen and watch him juke three guys. And, and Yeah, yeah, he's, he's not getting – he's not – He's not he's not that type of explosive guy where they're what they're what they were used to seeing where they could put on 28 points in the second quarter and, and that's the ball game. And and even out of the backfield, um, we saw a little bit with Henderson there the last couple games, but you know, you they're not JK Dobbins, they're not Trey Sermon, even. And that's another thing I think um uh thinks that think was kind of been lacking the past two years is inconsistency in the run game of having that horse you can lean on. You know, we saw Ryan Day. You know, some of his bigger victories as Ohio State ball coach, uh, you know, go back to 2019. Jake, who had, who, yeah, you know, you got the fields play where he scrambles and hits Garrett Wilson in the back of the end zone. He rips off a deep ball to Olave. Big highlights, everyone remembers, but you remember J.K. Dobbins got fed and ripped off four touchdowns. Um, Trey Sermon, I know the year later, granted, they didn't play Michigan, but. Uh, you know, won the, Trey Sermon won the Big Ten championship for Ohio State, and they really haven't had that that horse. Uh, that you can feed uh, uh, since Sermon, really, it seems like. So that's another issue there. I think that's that's putting uh, – that's slowing the offense down some. Is You know, you, you've got McCord, who's not a Stroud, not a Fields, not a Haskins, obviously. And, you know, not trying to knock the kid too much after today. But then you turn around and you don't necessarily even have a, uh, hey, you know what, we're just going to lean on J.K. Dobbins today and feed him. So I think that's the other issue, to, you know, culmination of issues. Second thing is that since I'm since I'm rolling here is you've got to get high percentage throws from McCord to get him going. And I think we saw some, <coughs> excuse me, early in the year trying to swing passes, little screen passes, bubble screens, get him some easy completions. That's really what you got to do is just to get him some easy completions to get his confidence going right away. High percentage throws, even if it's just four yards, it's still a completion where he can know, all right, I got this. Now we can get the ball rolling. Yeah, I mean, you really have to take the risk out of it, though, because even the the interception <coughs> was a pretty basic play. I mean, that, they, that wasn't a multi-read play. I mean, it's, it was a little hitch. I mean, and so I, I've i got an idea. I want to throw – I'm going to bounce this off of you. Should Ryan Day start scripting the first 10 plays? He, you, know, you know, a lot of those guys do. Because um, I don't think he does. I don't know if he does either. He very well could, for all we know. But and I'll probably ask him that next time I have an opportunity. To, I don't think he does. I've never that, heard him say he scripts the first ten. That would be a good question. Never heard. Um, that would be a good question, and, and to kind of get, hey, these are our bread and butter ten this week. Let's see what we can get out of it, and adjust from there. I know Lincoln Riley 
I believe he's a he's a big time scripter. As Andy well. Reid. Andy Reid, there you go, NFL, yeah, big time scripter. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Uh big time, big time play scripter, first 10 plays. So it's definitely something that could potentially be something to help out McCord, at least, you know, get him started early in whatever next bowl, whatever next uh, ball game they got. Let's get to uh, the, the the middle point I wanted to say for last, because it was kind of a good transition to talking about the offense and day's play calling and McCord's early struggles is to get into. There, obviously there are three, there are three obvious things. And if you can't, you know, if you want to order them differently than I order them, I'm not going to sit here and, and pound the table or, or, you know, attack you for it. But if you watch this game and you don't think it was cl- as clear cut as the defense blowing it again in the second half, losing the turnover battle and the more aggressive coaching staff being rewarded. If you, we can talk about it. I don't, I don't think it's worth talking about anything else. I, I, I don't, I think, I really think we could use this whole show on just those three things. And so the third thing is the most aggressive coaching staff got rewarded today. I didn't like Ryan Day's handling of either of the fourth and shorts mm-hmm. in the first half. Um, would it have mattered? Would any of this mattered in the first half? You'd like to think it would have, you know, it's still hard to overcome your defense, not getting a single stop in the second half, but maybe if you're up a little bit, maybe if you're, up seven instead of down four or up, up three or four instead of down four. Maybe it changes how the second half goes. I don't know, but um, he gets fourth. So it's like fourth and like a long yard there after a Xavier Johnson screen. Um, you know, you're just trying to get some yardage back there. They, they actually, he breaks it. And I thought, first of all, I thought he was closer than the spot. Mm-hmm. They gave him like a yard and a half short. I thought he was at, you know, he, I don't think he got it. People on Twitter say he got it. I don't think he got it, but he was within a yard. I mean, it was maybe half a yard short. And you're running out the punt team. Why aren't you sitting there like, hey, let's let this run for a minute. Delay a game is not going to be a huge factor there or even call a timeout. You want that play reviewed, first of all. When it becomes clear you're not going to get the play reviewed, if that if that was going to be the case, why are you running your punt team out there? You could take a delay and try and draw them offside. Or, call me crazy, you could go for it on fourth and one from roughly midfield. I mean, if if Michigan had been in that situation, there's like zero doubt in my mind they would have gone for it. And they did go for it every time they had a, really a chance to today. And they were rewarded for that. No, I think it goes down to uh, playing to win, playing not to lose was really – the difference in the two, oh, excuse me again, two head coaches today. Uh, Moore was putting it all on the line today, playing to win. Just in general, we can get into specific play calls, but you're exactly right. There, were, there was no hesitation in him. Where hey, we're gonna go, we're gonna go for it, and we're gonna get it. Um, I don't know what the mechanics on the sideline were, why that play didn't necessarily get reviewed, but uh, you know, in it specifically. But again, why not take a chance on a hard count? And see if you can't get a cheap one. And if you and if you want to punt anyways, okay, then take the delay, and you actually have more room for your punter from where you're punting from. Um, he has more room to work with there. And uh, so, no, I agree with you there. But then, but th- that was just kind of a microcosm of how the coaching staffs approached the game. And and we saw it later, where on two uh, went for it twice on fourth down on one of the scoring drives, if I recall correctly, for the U of M and Coach Moore. And, uh, you know, Ryan Day, again, I think, you know, we can go talk about uh, there at the end of the half, whatever happened there where he decided to settle for another 50, whatever it was, yard field goal there at the end of the half instead of trying to set himself up for a shot. Uh, again, that's just the kind of a microcosm, the difference in the attitudes of, uh, of of the coaching staff. Yeah, I thought that was – I thought that was big. I, I thought just the way they started this game – was disastrous on like three different levels. Like the guy, you think of the guys, and this can be my post-game observation column, but you think of the three guys you needed today, and I'm leaving Marv out of this a little bit because we know what, you know what you're getting out of Marv. Like you know what you're getting, you know what he's going to do to a defense, the attention he's going to take. So the three keys to the game, the three key human beings, to my opinion, to this game, were Kyle McCord, Ryan Day and Emeka Abuka because Abuka 
was going to be the guy with the favorable matchups. Mm. And what happens on the first three drives? Abuka drops an easy first down with some room to run after the catch. Ryan Day, Turtles, mm. on fourth and one. McCord throws a crippling interception on the third drive. So you had two chances to sustain sustain early drives, and you don't because of a drop in a, in my opinion, a poor coaching decision. Then your quarterback makes a really bad mistake. And so the three guys you needed to just keep this on the track for everybody else didn't. And yet you go into halftime down 14-10, and you go into halftime only down 14-10, in my opinion, it should have been at least 14-13. Why are you running the? Why are you not going for it on fourth and two there? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, well, I'll let you go before I rant on that. <laughs> why are you not going for it on fourth and two there? You know, the thing there too. You're talking about right before halftime. Yeah, right. So right before halftime, it's a 50 yard field goal. It's not like it's a 35 yarder, where you know it's in that kid's wheelhouse. You know, it's basically for all intents and purposes a hail mary. Yeah. And you know, if you want to take a shot at some points there right for half why not go big and, and throw one up to harrison what's the worst that possibly happens you go into halftime 14 10 uh you end up going out that way anyways when you let the clock run out and uh and uh um uh, uh with the field goal miss i mean i guess i'm you know making my own arguments here you could say well, well if someone picks six is it or fumbles you could block a kick you know that going back 10 years Auburn won a ball game on a long field goal attempt because they ran it back. So all those catastrophic counterpoints that you could say that you don't have from running the play are just as, just you know just just as much a, a thing that could happen uh, on a hail mary type play as a as a uh, as a long field goal like that. So not quite sure what thinking is there, but I think if you want to look at the difference in the game today, you go look at the fourth down calls and what they were and what and how the outcome uh, how the outcome of the game. Uh, uh, the outcome again was affected by the fourth down uh, decisions. Yeah, I, I just I thought the first one was ultra conservative. Like, are you really going to be this conservative in this magnitude of a game? I thought the second one was downright negligent. I mean, and I had people argue. This is the same argument. I swear, it's like like having like a deja vu moment here. I did the same thing last year on the 50 yard field goal against Georgia. And I said, look, you have to get that ball closer to kick a field goal. You were much more likely to convert a fourth and medium fourth and short in this case today than you were to kick that field goal. Mm. You're talking about a kicker and Jaden Fielding has been fine this year, but He's never made one for you 50 or longer. This was like 52 yards. He's never made one for you 50 or longer. He's three for five from 40 to 49. He's 60%. Even if you get it to the 25, if you get 10 more yards, he's still only 60% to make that kick. And, you know, the people in my, you know, in the mentions on Twitter are like, oh, well, you know, you didn't have to go for the touchdown. It's not about going for the touchdown. You needed more yards for the field goal. It didn't have to be a, you still, you had 30 seconds left. You can pick up the first down. You can get 10, 15, 20 more yards. You can make it a lot easier on your kicker. There was no excuse to kick, kick, to kick that field goal. There was, there was no, there was no reasonable uh, argument there to make, to make that attempt. And, you know, defense was playing well. I had someone, well, you know, we don't want, you don't want Michigan driving and scoring there. Okay, you don't trust your defense. Apparently, you shouldn't have the way they finished the game, but you don't trust your defense to stop Michigan from going 30 yards in 25 seconds. Would Michigan have even tried to go 35 yards in 25 seconds? Or I, I don't know. They were aggressive today, but that seems like a get out of dodge. We're getting the ball first in the second half, meal it out, and go into halftime if I'm Michigan there. So just some inexcusable management there at the end of the half that I think cost them at least three because again, you get that. They got some they got some third and shorts late in the game like fourth and two is a pretty open playbook is it not I mean you can throw it you can throw there you can run there you can do a lot of things it's like right on that edge where it's not too long to take the running game out of play there I just think I think you have to go for it if you get it you get up and you spike 
and you've got what 20 seconds, 22 seconds, take a couple shots with Marv, maybe take one sideline, maybe take the free eight yard out and get yourself down to what the, the 23, yeah. 24. Now you, you 40 yard kick. Now you've at least got a 60 plus percent chance of making that versus whatever percent chance they had to make. It's the same thing as last year where, well, that, the kick, the field goal is the right play. The field goal from someone who's never made a 50 yarder last year. And from someone who's never made a 50 yarder this year is not the right play in that situation with these types of stakes. You'll never that, convince me otherwise. That is not Mike Nugent. No. Yeah. If you had Nugent, he's already buried like five 50 yarders for you that year. Fine. Go for it. You've never even, this kid's ever attempted a 50 yarder since no, he's been at Ohio State. Yeah. Like, and, you know, that, you know, and, and again, I think we could go, you know, a couple of the other points there too. It, it's just, it's just those fourth down decisions are just a microcosm of, of how the coaches call this game in general. I mean, more would have gone for it. You know, he half back double or reverse flea flick or something. Um, he was going to try and get touchdowns. You know, Ryan Day was playing to score points, not necessarily touchdowns. And again, those fourth down, those fourth down decisions were the difference in the ball game today. Uh, at least that you know, at least looking back at hindsight, there one time through is is you know getting those first downs and, and it's just kind of the mindset of hey, you know what, we're going to go for it, we're going to play to win, we're going to get this and we're going to keep going instead of uh, no, 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 we're just going to wait, let the clock roll out, and we're going to go in halftime down. Uh, and it, I think another thing to talk about is talk about putting confidence, uh, uh, putting confidence, giving confidence in your players. Yes. And I think even Coach Day talked about this in the off season about he, he's just got to be more aggressive because that's what how he made his name, if you will, was being that aggressive guy. And you know it's tough when you make that transition from coordinator to head coach. That where you know when you're an aggressive coordinator, that's how you can make your name. So you could turn around and. Say, well, you know what, special teams defense got to do something too. But when you're a head coach and all three of those phases are your responsibility, you can tend to be, tend to be, uh, you know, we're seeing the effect now of being more conservative. But if that's, if that's how you want to be, you can't turn it on and off. You got to go, you know, and, you know, go, going back 10 years, Urban Meyer, when he took over Ohio State, he made some ridiculous early right away when he took over back in 2012 of, hey, you know what, we're going for a fourth and one period at our own 45. They get stuffed, and when you asked him after the game why, he said because that we're, we're, that's going to be our identity is we're going to get it no matter what. And and you know, Coach Day doesn't has got to find that ability to put that trust back in his team of hey, we're going to get this, and if we don't, I don't care, we're going to stop him anyways. Yeah, I don't know, like I don't know what it, it's not too late to change this. If you're right, like they're not. I, I don't care what anyone says, they're not firing Ryan Day. Like that's not happening. So Ryan Day is going to be the head coach next year. But here we are again, seemingly having some of the same conversations. We're having the same conversations about Jim Knowles. We're having the same conversations about game management. Uh, Offensively, we're having some same conversations we've had all year about slow starts for the offense. And it just, just changing things just to change them isn't the answer. The changes you make have to be impactful, but. I'm sh- I'm actually shocked. There were some things that didn't quite like. I-, I would love to sit here and say I'm shocked at the defense in the second half, but I'm not. I- I've I've said it even the last two years. I'm like, look, is the defense better with Jim Knowles than it was pre- before Jim Knowles? Yes. Is the defense been playing really good at- in times even last year? Absolutely. Defense had some great games this year. Defense won them a few games this year, but until I see it after Thanksgiving. <laughs> In the fourth quarter of a game being played after Thanksgiving, I'm going to be a little bit like eh, iffy on just, it's, I'm a seeing is believing person. If I can't see it, I don't believe it. <laughs> I got to show me. And so I'm not shocked about that really. Like this has kind of been the MO of the defense. I am, what I'm, what I am surprised about is just watching Ryan Day's mannerisms, his comments, the way he carried himself all week, even up until last night, even even watching the the pregame interview right before he went on the field today. If you would have told me that Ryan Day would have fourth and one close to midfield early in the game and would punt, and then would have fourth and two at the 35 with 25 seconds left in the first half, down four with no timeouts, and he would have 
brought out the field goal unit, I would have, I would not have taken that two leg parlay. I can tell you that right now. Like there's just, there's no way uh, where you, we, we can criticize it, but were you shocked by any of it today? Like what, what shocked you and maybe what happened that didn't like, Oh, here we go again. You know, I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, you go back to, Again, I hate keep going back to another loss to compare and contrast, but you look at the Ryan Day, Georgia, or the Georgia Ryan Day, the emotion, the we're going to go for it. Um, and, and, you know, that was his last huge game he was in. And then you go to today, and I, I'm with you. It's, you know, I think his quote was, we're going to swing or we're going to keep swinging or we're going to go for the fences or something like that. I think I heard him say this week. And then the first chance you get, you're playing to get walked. Uh, you know, you're trying to ride out the pitch count or whatever baseball analogy applies there uh, to keep that going. You know, yeah, no, I was I was, I was kind of surprised where it was, hey, our signal is we're going to try and, uh, you know, I mentioned this on our pregame show. Ryan Day was, hey, you know what, we're going to try and out Michigan, Michigan and, and play their game and just play a little bit better than they are. So I think those decisions really were shocking. I think it might be one of my points in there. I can't remember, but it was, you know, you're not, you haven't built that type of team. Uh, you know, there's a great quote, Styles makes fights. That's not their fight. They want to fight. They got to get these explosive plays. You've got, I don't know what, I'm not a draft follower guy, but, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. is probably going to be one of the top five, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? You you showed him, You showed more creativity getting him the ball against Michigan State than you did in this game. I mean, didn't he get a jet sweep? counter or something crazy like that against Michigan State on a reverse to make sure he got the ball. We didn't see that today. We saw – was it against Minnesota? They motioned him in the backfield and, and, and swung him out on a pass route. Um, and we saw that today. Um, so, again, you didn't you got the best weapon in college football and you, and you didn't go out of your way to find a way to make sure he got the ball uh, in the biggest game of the year. And I think that's another thing you could look at and say, hey, why are we getting this guy – being more creative with him against Michigan State than we are against our in our biggest game of the year. They just don't consistently, especially in big games, which are you know, like this isn't the NFL where like you can lose, you know, you play 17 games and even the worst team on your schedule has like a 25% chance of beating you, mm-hmm. <laughs> according to Vegas. Like you have at Ohio State, realistically, there's three or four losable games every year. There's eight, there's seven or eight games you're just going to win. You don't even have to show up and play your C game. You play a D game, you're going to survive. Um, so in the games that are, you know, important, it just feels like there's they don't play complimentary football. Like there's no like there's teams I can't like I don't think Michigan's fun to watch, but they have an identity, both offensively, defensively, and, and they complement each other and how they play offense and how they play defense. Like they're it's not pretty. I think when they run into teams like Georgia and Alabama, it's going to get them beat again because Georgia and Alabama can play that game and play it with better athletes. But they maximize what they have. And they do it because a lot because everyone in that building kind of knows what their identity is. And they play comp again, they play complimentary football, offense, defense, special teams. Same thing in the NFL, like, you know, like the Ravens. I don't think the Ravens are particularly fun to watch either. Um, you know, Lamar Jackson's kind of fun to watch sometimes, but they play complimentary football. But even like, it, but it's not even a, a physical thing. Like the Chiefs, the Chiefs play complimentary football. They know who they are. We're going to put it in 15's hands. He's going to, you know, and then defensively, we're not going to get so caught up into our stats as much as we are. We're going to get after the other team's quarterback. And if they, if they break some big ones on us or we, we get into a 35-31 game, we're perfectly comfortable doing that. They're comfortable with who they are. They're comfortable in their own skin. I don't get the sense that that happens at Ohio. Like, it just doesn't feel that way the last few years. It doesn't feel like the offense and defense kind of – everyone knows what their identity is, and the defense kind of knows how the offense is going to play. The offense kind of knows how the defense is going to play, and you're going to be comfortable in certain situations – it, I, I don't, I don't get that sense. I don't know. Am I, am I like off on this? Yeah, it's, it, it, it does seem kind of disjointed at times um, where, Hey, we're going to be aggressive. We're going to try and get up 30 points at halftime and other games today. For example, we're going to punt and play defense on, on fourth and one from the 50. Uh, and it goes back. You're hit the right on the head. I think the easiest 
easiest uh, example to use in this in football, uh, especially when it was coming out, you know, 30 years ago, whatever it is now, was, uh, you know, how mummy and the air raid offense. Hey, we're going to we're going to score points. Uh, and I want the ball back in three plays. Either they score or we score. But just give me the ball back. I don't care if we win 99 to 98. So there's a very easy example, uh, well-known example of of having an identity, a culture, if you will, of this is what our team's going to be about. U of M, again, to their credit, um, they, they have an identity. We're going to play tough physical defense, bend but don't break, if you will. Uh, we're going to run the heck out of the ball, and we're going to take our shots on the play-action passing game uh, when they're there. And we're perfectly happy to win games by six points, as we saw today. Um you know, Ohio State this year, I think this year in particular, too, they've really struggled to to figure out exactly who they're going to be. Are we going to run the ball? How are we going to run the ball? All right, well, let's try this this week and that this week. You know, down the stretch there, it looked like they kind of found their identity. Uh, you know, or are we going to be, we're going to pass it all around? You know, how are we going to pass it all around? You know, we never really got a great identity uh, of the team, particularly this year. I think the last two years, one thing you could say at least was, at least Ryan Day knew he had tried to score 70 every game. Uh, to try and win. So they did at least have that going when they had Stroud as quarterback. They can really go back to maybe Fields in 2019 was the last time Ohio State seemed like they are playing complimentary football uh, uh, on both sides of the ball where, where you know, they're going to take their shots and run the ball with Dobbins and we're going to play some good defense. Super chat, Ryan Dawes. Which, and this is a good <clears throat> time to throw that up there with what we're talking about. Which does Day have? A fear of failure or a fear of success? He cannot help the Wilson touchdown in McCord's INT, but he did not call a good game. I don't care how close it was. No moral victories. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it feels to me like it is a, f- a fear of failure at this point. Um, I think today's first half play calling epitomized that. I think when you all week are sending the message that you're going to let it, you're going to be relaxed. You're going to get a great night of sleep. You're going to get a great night of sleep. We're out and relaxed with energy, play our best game. I think playing your best game would be going forward on fourth and one around midfield and, and saying before the game to your team, if you get offense, Kyle, Trey, Marvin, if you get us into fourth and one or fourth and two at anywhere close to midfield, we're going for it today and you, you practice it and you install that type of mindset in your team. And, and, and Devin, you, you did it very well. You did it better than I did. Mine was, I was so long winded on my last thing about complimentary football and identity. You were able to kind of sum it up very quickly, which is, are you a go forward on fourth and one and two team? Or are you not? Cause you either are, or you aren't, you're not, you're not a dabbler. You're not well against this team. We're going to, and against this team, we're not, you either do it or you don't. And that's why, again, that's why the Chiefs and the Eagles played in the Super Bowl last year and why they very well may play in the Super Bowl again this year. They know exactly who they are. Nick Sirianni is going to go for it on fourth and one every time. And he knows it. And his defense knows it. And so it's not a surprise if they get stopped on a fourth and one at their own 35 and the defense has to go back out there and get a momentum stop. They're not surprised by that. That's how they practice. That's how they play. And everyone's on the same page. And I just don't feel like that is happening here at this program right now. When it matters most, your defense needs to know what type of offense is going to be out there every day. And your offense needs to know what type of defense is going to be out there every day. And when you know, when, when all the cards are uh, are shown and all the, everything's on the table, you can deal with the sudden changes. You can deal with the turnover or you can deal with the, the fourth and one that doesn't get through, or you can deal with the touchdown drive. Even that, that happens. You can deal with those things when you kind of, when you, know what the identity of your of your team is and i just i thought i kind of knew what the identity of this team was today going into today and then again those fourth those fourth and short calls kind of made me question it all over again and i think what makes it even more frustrating here as we're sitting here talking about it with those fourth and short calls yes they did not have huge runs today i think what was what was the longest run of the game 12 yards something like that i mean they were, they were ripping off huge yards but they were getting yards yeah, they were getting some knockback and getting and getting the running backs through. So it wasn't like the running game was a complete and total. You know, we've got to completely avoid it. Uh, you know, it was it was well enough where running the ball in fourth and one wasn't a terrible idea uh, in those circumstances. So I think I think 
two things to compare for Ohio State fans is Jim Tressel. We're going way back now. Uh, Jim Tressel was we're going to punt on fourth and one guy. And when would he? When did he have disasters? When he decided he was going to go for it on fourth and one. That wasn't his team, right? Contrast that. Urban Meyer was like I mentioned before. We are going to go for it on fourth and one, and everybody knew that. And when did he get in trouble? When he decided not to. But they had that ingrained in their DNA. I think I think you may have may have uh, uh, great 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 catch there. Great observation that we're not quite sure what Ryan Day is. You know, you go back to last two bowl games. Uh, Utah and Georgia, he was not only we going to go for it on fourth and one, we're going to go for a touchdown on fourth and one from our own 40. And, you know, that's how Harrison Jr. burst on the scene was a fourth and one 40 yard touchdown catch uh, they went for it against Utah. So, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's uh, definitely something you got to find in your team. So, you know, so you know who you are. I, I just think it's hard as an offense to, if you're if you're not sure what your coach is going to do in a given situation, and I'm not talking about a, a specific play call, but in terms of a decision, am I punting? Am I not punting? You know, am I kicking a field goal or am I going for it? Am I kicking a field goal or am I punting? When you don't know, I, I just think you have to practice the way you're going to to call it on game day. So if you're not sure how you're going to call it on game day, I don't know how you can instill in practice any type of identity when you don't even know yourself what you're going to call on a game day. That's I'll give you a trickle down here. Example here. Uh, if you know your coaches, I'm going to go for it on a fourth down guy and you've got, I don't know, let's just say fourth and two and you call pass play that quarterback. Let's even back up a step. You've got third and long, you know, your quarterback's going to go for it. You know, your coach is going to call fourth and long. All right, so you take the seven-yard check down instead of trying to push the ball down the field because you know your coach is going to call, go for it on fourth and down, okay? That's one school of thought that we're talking about here. Flip it, okay, hey, coach is not going to go for it on fourth and down. I know that as a quarterback because for three years, he's never gone for it on fourth and short. All right, I got to know. I got to hit that 15-yard out route to try and pick up this first down because if not, we're going to punt the ball. So, again, there's definitely a trickle down of not having that uh, philosophy for, throughout the entire program where everyone understands uh, uh, what it's going to be. And I think you could flip that to defense even. All right, do I need to be uh, more aggressive here? You know, because uh, the coach is going to be more aggressive on offense. Hey, we need to get the ball back real quick. Or do we need to sit and cover two all game? And, and because we know coach doesn't want to be aggressive. Again, kind of using Meyer and Trestle as examples uh, earlier in that overall philosophy of your program. Yeah, it it's just that they've got to figure that out. Um, more than almost anything else, they've got to figure that out. Are we a team who plays loose and aggressive all the time, or are we not? And and in today's game, I don't know how you can play any other way. I, I really don't. Um, I don't know how you win the the beat the Georgias and the Alabamas of the world and the Michigans of the world now without having that mindset. I just, in, to your point, even at the ball carriers, if, if I'm a ball carrier, if I, so if I'm Trey Henderson on the check down and it's third and eight and I catch the ball five yards short of the sticks, if I know we're going to go for it, I'm putting my head down and just pushing forward and falling forward. And now I've got my team in fourth and two. If I don't know if they're going to, if I think they're going to punt, then I've got to make, you know, three different moves to try and get the first down because what's the difference between fourth and two and fourth and six, we're going to punt anyway. But I don't even think you have that. Like, I don't think in the minds of your players, like you, you don't have that of like, yeah, I, I need to know. Cause when you're aggressive, it changes. It really changes the sticks. And I, I hate to use another Eagles quote, but like Nick Sirianni is incredible with how he phrases this mail. So I'm just going to steal from him only because he says it better than I do. When you know you're going for it on fourth and one every time, no matter what, every every drive you start is first and nine. Yes. It's first and nine. It moves the sticks. It moves the sticks up a yard. I, I haven't heard that quote before, but I really like it, and I'm going to steal that as well, like all the coaches do. 
but you're exactly right. There's something about being aggressive, knowing, hey, you know, we got four downs to get this, and I like that. It's hey, it's first and nine. Um, but again, it goes. I think it's just bigger. The bigger picture is what's our identity, yep. and I, we got to sell into it. Again, U of M is U of M. Uh, you know, we got an identity. We're going to run the ball, play great defense, and uh, and take opportunistic pass shots when they're there. And, and they've made it work for them, and they made it work for them, obviously, at a very high level here three years in a row. Ain't no getting around it at this point. Um, and I think that's also credit to Coach Moore was able to just keep the ship rolling with everything, you know, with everything there. And he just kept kept on, kept on, kept doing what they do because they had that identity. There was no change in, in the way their game was going to be played just because they had a different coach uh, in charge on the sideline today. Yeah, I mean that—that that is the one thing you can say about that today is—is is they, everyone was on the same page over there. Everyone was on the same page, and it's becoming a thing up there. Where and we're going to get into the narratives here. I think now as we wait for our Buckeye Weekly guys to to come through, but this was the narrative game. I said it the other day. If Ohio State won this game today. The narrative was that Ohio State is back as the dominant team in the league. And the whole Michigan was tired of getting beat every year. And so they cheated to win. And now they weren't able to cheat. So look what happened. That was the that was what was at stake for Ohio State. And the obviously the opposite was at stake for Michigan, where if they win, now they're going to be able to go say, well, we beat you anyway. What, what, what are you talking about? You can't beat us. It doesn't matter what we do. You know, we don't need to steal signs. We don't, you know, we're just better. And we're still the best team in the conference. So this was, this is why I thought this was probably the biggest version of this game that I can remember. Um, so if we're going back, so we're going back to like 1990. <laughs> like, but... You know, I know 06 was one versus two. Very similar situation to this one on the field. Like, I, I grant you that. I grant you that game was every bit as big on the field that day as this one in terms of implications and everything else and hype and all that stuff. But there weren't these off-the-field narratives, too, at stake that really no matter what happens now with Michigan moving forward and there's going to be a lot to unfold here this offseason. It's going to be a very interesting next six to 12 months in Ann Arbor. It's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, but even if that gets sideways for them, they're still just going to point back to this. Like, oh, we beat you three times in a row. You, you know, we got caught cheating and you caught us and you, you know, Ryan Day's brothers invest, you know, whatever, whatever conspiracy theories are up to these days. But we beat you three times. We didn't have Connor Stallions on the sideline. And they're going to have to stew on that. And that's, I think that's a tougher, that's a narrative problem. That's a real, that's a real narrative problem. I think the narrative was going to swing wildly one way or the other today. And so now we'll see. I mean, I also, you know, I, this isn't the playoff show, but, and everyone's going to get mad at me again like they did last year at this time. But, you know, the scenario, so I was very optimistic last year after the game. I said, look, Ohio State's got a very clear and not even clear, but maybe even po even probable, certainly possible path to the playoff, despite the debacle today. Despite this game being much closer in score and everything else and come down to the final minute the way it did today, I'm not seeing the path this year. They are going to need... I probably an unprecedented level of chaos. 2007 um, type chaos. Yeah. I mean, they're going to need Texas has to lose. I, I don't, I don't, know. I don't know. Think Oregon and Washington. I mean, so Michigan's in Georgia. I mean, you're going to need Georgia to win. Beat Alabama, knock Alabama out. Okay. So Georgia's in, obviously Michigan's in. Michigan could lose to Iowa. They're in. Michigan's in, so go ahead and beat Iowa by 100. What does it matter? Um, you need Washington to beat Oregon again. You don't want to get in the situation where you're one of like six one-loss teams. 
Like you need this to be very clear cut. So now Washington's in. So now there's only one spot. Um, and it's, you know, coming down to, okay, can, can, so you need Texas to lose. We know Oregon's out cause they lost to Washington. We need Texas to lose. You need Alabama to lose to Georgia. What am I missing? I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. There's a bunch. I mean, just just those three things are going to be really tough. There, there's a bunch in there, and I, I'm not even. Sure. Oregon's going to be favorite over Washington, I think, and Texas is going to be a really big favorite in the Big Twelve game. And I've already seen the early line on Bama Georgia. That's not that big. Like people think that's going to be like a field goal game, and who knows? I'm not convinced Georgia's not going to beat them by ten or fourteen. But I looked at last year. I'm like, well, USC's defense is terrible. They could totally lose again to Utah. You know, you looked at last the way last year played out. There were so many things that you could see if you had watched the sport all year long. You could see, yes, USC is vulnerable to Utah. They've already lost to them. They could totally lose to them again. Utah is a very bad matchup for USC. You could totally see that. And there's things that happened last year where it just made some sense. And even like last year, like Oregon State, Oregon, uh, that Oregon State line coming up into the game, they were they were playing, they were red hot. The line was like much closer than people expected it to be. I was like, yeah, this is up. I even predicted them to beat Oregon. And so there were things last year. I, I don't see it this year, but uh, let's quickly, before I let you get to that, let's thank WagerWire, uh, our sponsor for the Instant Reaction Show. WagerWire is a sports betting app. You don't, they don't take your action, but they organize all of your sports books in one place for you. Um, so it's everything, all your action, your betting history, your stats. You can sign up for sports, new sports books, get their sign up bonuses all through one app, WagerWire. They're on Twitter at WagerWire. And uh, they're, they're, again, they're our instant reaction show sponsor. Please uh, go download the app. You can get it at the uh, iTunes or, or iStore. You can get it on Google Play. Um, just search WagerWire and you can download the app. Please use uh, promo code. Buckeye huddle, all one word. Just that'll let them know that we sent you there and that lets them know that them sponsoring us is, is bringing them some business. But the thing I personally like about them is again, they don't take your action. So they're actually incentivized by you guys winning because they just, they just want you to use the app to track all your bets and place your bets through and everything else. So um, the more you win, the more you use the app, the better they do. So um, wager wire uh, on Twitter at wager wire or uh, in the app store or Play Store if you're on Google. Uh, please download and promo code Buckeye Huddle. Um, okay, Devin. Uh, let's we're gonna get we're gonna rile up the natives again. Is there a path? Do you do you see Ohio State less likely to make the playoff than last year? More likely about the same. We do the eye doctor thing. Is it better, worse, the same? What, what do you think? You know, I think the one of the you're gonna put a plus negative column up or plus delta chart up. I think one of the things that the Ohio State offense had going in its favor last year um, was C.J. Stroud and how many points they could put up. This year, they don't have that eye test, if you will, that eye candy to dangle out there and go, hey, we can score with anybody. Look how good C.J. is. Look at all these wide receivers, et cetera. Uh, so that's that's definitely – they don't have that uh, – that, that eye candy, that eye test appeal like they had last year um, where they could just chalk it up to, well, they just had a bad game. And then, you know, we even saw, I can't remember what the point spreads were last year, but it was like all of a sudden Ohio State was still favored. Even though they just lost by 20 on a neutral site, they were still a favorite over Michigan, which I don't understand how any of that works, but it, it was what it was. Um, so I really don't know. You know, it, you know there, there was also a scenario where uh, Bama – knocks off Georgia, but because Georgia's back-to-back and has been rolling all year, they go, you know what, put them in. And then SEC gets two teams because, you know, Bama's not going to be left out being SEC champs with one loss. So there's two teams taken right off the bat. You get the Pac-10 winner and uh, Michigan gets in. So there you go. There's, uh, you know, I just don't, I just don't see a path uh, for Ohio State without an absolute 2007 chaos of the upsets being upset and some weird dynamic of someone who needed to get upset to make the upset look worse gets upset or, or so, you know, I can't even think of anything witty or clever to say about that. So no, I just don't, I just don't see it this year, uh, a path this year, like there was last year. And I knew I was forgetting something when I was going down the list that you need Florida state to lose. 
I didn't even think about Florida State. Yeah, there you go. They're what they're still undefeated, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they're still undefeated now. Here, here's where I think because people are gonna. What what I think people need to look at is okay, what's the team? How far back do you have to go in the rankings to find a team that will not pass Ohio State? And that's kind of the question you have to ask yourself. And I need it's almost like I need the rankings from me. Here, here's what I here's what I think about that. I don't think I and I know there's Ohio State fans today that are thinking, oh, they'll pass us. I really don't think so. I don't think Louisville can pass Ohio State. And I think it that I think that was true two weeks ago, but I think it's true today because that's where I think the Jordan Travis injury really comes in is now Louisville doesn't even play Florida state with Jordan Travis. And I will believe it when I see it, that they would put one loss ACC champ Louisville in over one loss, Ohio state, given the the schedules. So I think what you would want there just to be sure though, is maybe Florida state loses to Florida and then beats Louisville. I don't know if that changes everything. That that really takes the ACC out. But I think if Florida State loses, I actually think Florida State might lose. They might. I mean, Florida tonight's a rivalry game, maybe. Um, but they need a lot of help. Like, if you're yelling, I'm not looking at the comments right now because we have our own private chat that I have to pay attention to. So if you're screaming at me this year about this, I'm a little more sympathetic to you right now. So I can actually agree with you guys that it's it's very likely not happening. But last year, everyone was screaming at me while I was having the same conversation at this exact same time. And I was kind of telling everyone, like, this is still very possible. I know everyone's like, oh, you know, we're terrible. CJ Stroud sucks. Ryan Day can't win the big one. They'll never put us in the playoff. We'll lose by 80 to Georgia. And I was very anti that last year. And this year, again, I just, I don't, see it. So I'm whoever's yelling at me in the comments, because I'm sure there are people doing it. I, pr- I'm almost certainly agreeing with you right now. I don't see it, but we have to talk about it. I mean, what else are we going to talk about? We can only, we can only say, you know, defense blew it. Kyle McCord threw interceptions and Ryan day turtled on fourth and short so many times. Here, here's, here's, I want to, I want to go back and talk about the narrative that you discussed leading into this game. Uh, you know, it almost unfolded like a, like a WWE storyline. It seemed like with all the buildup had nothing to do with actually what was going on in the football field. Uh, they actually, it actually ended up being a six point, actually pretty dadgum good football game. You know, obviously as Ohio state fans were not happy with how it turned out, but it was a pretty good game. Uh, you know, pretty good game to watch a classic game, especially with some of the, you know, to put up there at least in the past 20 years or so. Um, but I think, you know, we talk about narratives and uh, it's almost like Lou Holtz got his revenge today um you know because what was lou holt's narrative you know we kept saying the word narrative and what was the narrative on a ryan day football team they're not tough they're not physical and you know that that's not that's not their game they're they're a glorified seven on seven offense or whatever whatever the the negative comments were well if you want to discuss narratives after this game did lou holt's get his revenge because what's what's the u of m uh you know what are they hanging out? We're gonna be a tough, physical, and we're gonna beat you up football team. And you know, you look at things like, hey, they couldn't get off the field. Ohio State defense couldn't get off the field on, on in the second half. You know, U of M scored on every one of their possessions second half. Granted, they're still field goals, but you know, in a six point game, those add up real quick. So here we are again. You know, we're talking the whole source of Ryan Day here at the end of the year. Uh, you know, so to speak, because again, you know, in a tough physical football game, uh, Ryan Day coach ball club. Came up six points short. And I think that's mostly, and it's, it's kind of weird because I think that was mostly a toughness thing on defense today in the second half. I thought one of the, one of the bright spots I thought today for Ohio state as the game kind of wore on and started to play out, I thought the Ohio state offensive line really did well up front, especially in the run game. And that's kind of where we thought like, okay, maybe Michigan doesn't have the pass rushers it's had in the past, but they are really good in the interior on the defensive line. They're going to stop the run. They did a little bit early. It took Ohio State a couple drives to get kind of going, but they were they were moving the football on the ground today. I, thought they, I, I don't think they lost – I don't think the Ohio State offense lost the toughness battle. I think the Ohio State offense lost – 
the decision-making battle, both from the quarterback and the head coach. I think the defense ultimately lost the physical battle. And that's, that's the thing that didn't particularly shock me. Um, even going back to like the Notre Dame game, there were points in the, like the third quarter of that game. And really up until the very last couple, maybe drive or two of that game where Notre Dame started moving the ball on the ground in the second half. Um, and so the defense was ultimately able to gather itself and get a couple of key stops in the fourth, late in the fourth quarter. But that Notre Dame game turned because the defense started getting bullied a little bit in the run game. That's how the, the, the 10, nothing went to 14, 10 or whatever it was. And today you're facing a, a team that's got that even more ingrained in their identity than Notre Dame does in terms of, we're not going to stop trying to run the football, even if you stop us in the first half. And I think that's gotta be probably the most disheartening thing. I think you can, I think you can look back and be like, yeah, poor decisions, turn You know, I think you can look back on that and be like, well, that's either correct, easily correctable from a decision-making standpoint or turnover, maybe, you know, you know, if, if turnovers, things like that can be a little bit fluky, but you once again, couldn't get off the field in the second half of a game. You didn't play complimentary football in the second half. That, that's got to be the big, like, how do you fix that this off season? Do you have to make a change in terms of coaching? Do you have to, like, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. You have to evaluate your recruiting, the mentality. I, I, don't, I don't think that. I covered a lot of these guys in Ohio State's defense, like, I don't think like two guys, I don't think played well today. I'm never questioning their toughness. Like I don't think Tommy Eichenberg played well today at all. I don't think Sonny Styles played well today at all. I would never say they're not tough. Um, so what is the, what is the change? Because you already, you, you essentially, you didn't change your scheme this year, but you did play defense differently than you played defense last year. And you still kind of got the same result in terms of situationally, not either understanding what the situation was or not making the proper adjustments given the context of what the situation is like what? Cause it's easy to, it's easy to fix talent issues or even decision-making like as far as, yeah, we're just going to go for it on fourth down. We're going to be more aggressive on fourth down. I don't know how you look at the defense. And you're like, Oh yeah, that's the answer this off season. I think one of the things that, that you could look at is utilization of your personnel and um, I'll contrast it with and, and mention Georgia here. Uh, one of the clinics that's out there, Kirby Smart, I believe, talks about putting putting guys on the field that are really good at doing something. And meaning, uh, let's start up front here. Uh, the Ohio State defensive line, big picture, the starting four are pretty stout against the run. And again, I know it sounds kind of fresh in everyone's brain and going, hey, they couldn't get field second half, but they weren't. Like they they were pretty good against the run all year all year this year even today they were they were pretty pretty stout, um, but they weren't really dynamic explosive, were negative play creators except really only one consistently really was Mike Hall Jr. Uh, is the one that really today he was the one that generated the, the pressure for the sack. All right, so we get in third and passing right we think we're gonna pass. Well, they had no problem running Hancock on and off the field today as a nickel DB for Cody Simon. Uh, and we, we've saw how state defenses do this with Larry Johnson. Why can't we run four defensive ends on the field when we're, when we're, when we're anticipating pass? We don't have to do a wholesale crazy uh, uh, situational, you know, all out pressure, but just utilizing our personnel. Hey, you know what? We've got this backup defensive end. He's terrible against the run, but man, we can't block him. When we do one on one pass rush drills, that's put him in and pass rush situations and see if he can't get to the quarterback, especially when it's an area uh, that they've really kind of struggled at this year. You know, they, I don't know what was the, who had the leading sacks this year. Do we have anybody more than five up front? I mean, we're sitting here asking that question. Maybe, that's maybe not a good leak. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, that's not a good, that's not a good, uh, good question to have to ask and have to think about the answer. So I think Georgia last year, I can't remember the kid's name, but number 13, I think he was a true freshman last year, but how they use him. Like, he was phenomenal on pass right. He got Paris Johnson Jr. was a top ten draft pick, and he spun him like a revolving door when he came in on third pass, third and pass for a situation. Utilize uh, 
utilize your roster better without having to completely change your scheme. But if you can run a nickel DB on, there's no reason why I couldn't run a third defense. Caden Curry, did he get on the field other than kickoff? Yeah, you know, not much. Um, I, you know, not to, not to break you up here, but I was actually thinking about that earlier as we were talking about the defense. Like, did they wear down? Yeah, that's a great point. Not, I saw a little bit of Kenyatta today. <laughs> Didn't feel like they rotated much on the D line today. It's like they, they kind of let their their four go out there and be like, okay. So I don't know if that was a factor, but to your point about like a Rushman package, this team may have more tools to do that than maybe any team they've had in the past. Because here's the thing: in the past, you're like putting some guys in, in like even like a Jalen Holmes or a, a Tyquan Lewis. You might be putting them in the middle. It's like ooh, little light or you know, JT could easily play inside on pass rushing downs. Caden Curry could easily play inside on pass rushing downs. And did this year. Yeah. So you could get a lot of different combinations out there in that type of package. They didn't really do that today at all. Um, well, I'll, I'll see that and I'll raise you Darren Lee. Darren, Darren Lee in 2014 was used as a defensive end on third down. Well, and he was a 230 pound linebacker. I mean, he won. Well, he was, Dominated the Bama game playing defensive end. That's a beautiful segue because we talked we, as my wheels were turning on off season changes. I, I've actually been saying this for like three years, and I hope maybe today, if something good can come for Sonny Styles from today, he should be playing stand up edge. <laughs> he the close. I've been saying this. I've been saying this since actually like his sophomore year of high school. The closer Sonny starts the snap to the line of scrimmage, the better, more disruptive football player he becomes. When you're having him cover tight ends, you're not utilizing his strengths. When you're having him t- you know, eight, 10 yards off the ball and crashing down and trying to read where the run, that's not what you need to turn him loose. And so that would be one change I would make this offseason is tell go to Sonny and say we're putting – and if you ever see him, he's in person, he's 235 pounds and he's still like thin. Like go to Sonny the second week of January when the season is over and say, dude, you're going to be a 250 pound edge rusher next year. Do what they should have done to Baron Browning. Yeah. And do it with Sonny Styles. And he's a stand, he's a pass rusher next year. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going down that. That's actually something I talked about this offseason because you look at the Bama's and the Georgia's defense and the – I'm going to get lost in names to so help me out here as always. But was it Nolan Smith, the really good defensive end from Georgia? My, 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 the Eagles now, right? My former number one high school recruit in the country, yes. No, think, Nolan think, Smith fan club right here, yes. I think, he's, I think Styles was bigger than him. He is. He is bigger than Nolan. He's he may not be bigger than now in the NFL. He's heavier than Nolan. He is. But he, may, but he was definitely bigger than him on the rosters in college. Uh, and then Bama had uh, um, Texans defensive end. Anderson. Anderson Jr. Yep. Styles, I think, is the same size as him. Right. Very, very close. Yeah. Yeah. No, move down. It goes back to that move down, add speed. Um, and, again, utilize your, your personnel situationally. Again, that's why I kind of go to that Darren Lee example of, like, all right, he's still our best linebacker. We're still going to be a 4-3 defense. But when we get third long, we want more speed in the field because we know it's a pass rush. He's one of our best pass rushers. Let's have him rush the passer. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, just utilizing your roster better to, to put them in positions to do what they do well. Again, you could talk about you know JT moving into three technique uh, on third downs, Caden Curry being brought in for a pass rush, and just getting more speed on the field in the situations where you need it. You know, they ran on five defensive linemen at one point this game. It's same thing, but opposite or doing it, doing it the other way around. Hey, we need more speed on the field. We saw them dabble with some type, some type of dime package throughout the year where they were kind of going three, two, six, with a couple extra safeties brought in there again. So, but again, that's just one thing. I almost say it's an easy thing you could do. If you want to look at how you can improve your defense quickly, it's just utilizing your defense uh, personnel situationally, uh, better instead of having the same 11 or same 12 on the field the entire game. And we're not going to waste a lot of time on this because our, our Buckeye weekly guys are kind of ready to take over, but you've, you've brought this full circle in a way where we have talked so much on the show about identities, complementary football, everyone being on the same page from offense, defense, special teams. 
are Jim Knowles and Larry Johnson on the same page. So you want to make these moves. We want to take, we want to take Sonny Styles and put him at defensive end. Maybe who knows? Maybe someone in the WAC wants to do that. How does that go over with Larry, Larry Johnson? That maybe that's where this whole thing starts more so than we we wrap it up with it. That's where the whole thing maybe starts. Or is that the right combination in terms of like Larry Johnson's maybe the greatest college defensive line coach of all time? But if if him and Knowles are not on the same page with the direction they want to take this defense, then something has to give there. You either have to change your defensive line coach or your defensive coordinator. You you have to. You can't you can't have this identity crisis all over your roster. You just you just can't. Um, so with that said, it's like I just threw some gas on the fire with that comment. Uh, Tony, Tom, Kevin, whoever we got down there. How are we doing? Uh, have we survived? No one got assaulted. Everyone got out of the press box no, safely. No, we we survived. We were the only ones that survived. Tom is still somewhere in the midst of the Michigan post game right now. So we'll know more about him later, but he'll get here eventually. Right now it's me and Kevin, but uh, Mark, thank you. Thank Devin. I'm sure uh, the masses have been fired up and uh, we will get to all of the comments once Kevin is back to the computer. But uh, we do want to welcome you to uh, Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here sometimes with Kevin Noon and at this moment with Kevin Noon. Kevin, how's it going? Well, it's cold and it's going to be a cold 370 days or something like that for Ohio State fans and players alike as the Buckeyes came up short here in Ann Arbor, uh, got off to a bad start managed to fight all the way back up to a tie and just really kind of ran out of gas. And even, even with that still had an opportunity for some Notre Dame magic. Yeah. I, I don't know what's worse losing like this or losing like last year where you just get overwhelmed at the end. But this one for me, it just felt like they were battling the entire way, climbing uphill the entire way, starting off with the interception and then just never, even even when they scored to tie it at 17 all, Michigan came right down, and you've like you've restarted your uh, your travel back up. It's the whole Sisyphus thing, pushing a rock uphill, and then the next morning, you got to do it all over again. I know Tom, when he gets here, is going to go off on Ryan Day, electing to let 30 seconds run off the clock at the end of the second quarter. So, Kevin, if you would like to do that right now, and then Tom and I can both rail against that decision if you would like to feel free well it was a curious decision we both kind of tweeted about it at the moment that it happened uh we both tried to be pretty chill about it but it was not a it was not a great decision brian day was not only asked once about it he was asked twice about it and i just don't know when you think that a 52 yard field goal is your best you know best course of action at that point uh maybe it changes the geometry in the game a little bit if they do get it in terms of where you are because ohio state would have drives where it would look so easy for ohio state to score it would look so easy and it would be immediately followed up with a drive by Michigan, where it was not all that difficult for Michigan either. So whenever Michigan struggled, Ohio State struggled. Whenever Ohio State had had some good fortune, Michigan had good fortune. But I really do not like that call. And I think one of the biggest points that we're going to talk about is Ohio State spends all year talking about preparing for Michigan, having something ready for Michigan. And it really didn't appear that Ohio State went that far off of its play sheet for this. I mean, certainly I saw a couple plays that didn't hit that maybe were a little bit different, but it was, again, just very much the same thing. You know, Michigan empties the chamber with, uh, you know, mm -hmm. half a pass and things like that. So, again, another question. This was not the UGA Peach Bowl, Ryan Day, we were all promised. No, and I, th I think that was – and we apologize if you hear some yelling – there, there's some other shows going on where it feels like absolute um, yelling. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to mention that. But I apologize for that. The um, the Ryan Day thing, I think this is one of the reasons why I went with Michigan. And I'm not going to say I told you so. I'm just like, I need to see it. And w this was the same 
Ryan Day against Michigan that we've seen in terms of the conservative calling. Uh, we And I don't know if that was – maybe they had a bigger plan, but that first interception changed some of that where it's like, well – and, for, and we can talk about that first interception. I don't know if people saw the Kyle McCord um, interview after the game where this is basically an RPO, and McCord was only reading the linebacker, and he was just firing it to Marvin, and he didn't even see that there was Will Johnson there who jumped the the route and, you know, doing what he did. And as Ryan Day said, it was a good play by the defender, but Kyle McCord didn't ever see that. And you can't have that. Like, I – and then he starts out four for ten, and then he goes like nine for nine. nine and for you nine, see the good yeah. Marvin, you see the good Kyle McCord for the better part of two quarters. But you can't afford the bad Kyle McCord to pay for the good Kyle McCord because you still wind up short. You ended up six points short, uh, and the the the, des- the deciding score in this game was basically the first score when Michigan had the seven yard touchdown drive because of the interception. Right. And, and, and that's the thing. I mean, just, and Marvin was asked about, you know, maybe was there more that you could have done there? And Marvin was like, well, you know, Will Johnson, you know, the DB had, you know, had good position there and it kind of, it was what it was at that point. So, I mean, that certainly was, was problematic. You get away maybe from what it is that you, you want to do. I mean, Ohio state held Michigan, I think on its first three drives to 20 yards and it looked like, okay, this is going to be an absolute rock fight. This is going to be 10 to 6, something along those lines. And we've we've seen that before of where Ohio State's offense, for whatever reason, doesn't necessarily get it going. The defense carries and carries and carries, and it finally just doesn't happen. And, you know, Jim Knowles certainly looked like he had been run over by a Mack truck at the end of a uh, at the end of the game, and you know he's going to—he's never going to blame his players, and he's going to say, which which he did, you know, the buck stops here. You know, I was I wasn't good enough. We're going to have to do better. Well, he did say that there were the players were in position; they just didn't make the the plays at, at times. But you know, just the inability to get off the field. Those third, and they weren't all that successful on third downs, but they were three for three on fourth downs, and it, it's something we've seen from Michigan all year where. They do just enough first and second down, and you, you've got like four yards to get on third and fourth, and and they did it. It was just this suffocating thing that we have seen from Michigan. And the Ohio State defense gave up a score on every single drive in the second half, I believe. And we saw the Ohio State had like three successful drives all over like 50 or 60 yards, one of them ending in a missed field goal. The Michigan had all of those successful drives right in a row, and it was um, it was a con- tremendous counter by Michigan to counter everything Ohio State. Every good drive Ohio State had, you would see Michigan then have their own drive. We're going to tag Tom in, and I'm going to tag tag out. So, you yeah, throw in your comments, and, and Kevin's back on on the uh, the producer's chair right now to go ahead and um, get to your comments and questions because I'm sure you guys have much more to say. Tom, I was waiting for you to get here to allow you to go off on Ryan Day for the decision at the end of the second quarter to not go for it on fourth down and, and instead to do the uh, let's settle for the 52 yard field goal which didn't happen didn't work a year, you know last season there was no way in the heck it was going to work this time that was um, to me that's just an, the like a microcosm of the approach against Michigan well you had that and then you had the fourth and one at the 46 in the first quarter and it feels like that's just you know Ryan Day loves to talk about how he's going to be aggressive and then it comes time to make a decision and it's like well just this once i'm going to just this once we're going to punt the football and it's even it's like maybe a little bit defensible the first time like okay it maybe it was a low scoring game maybe it's going to be a low scoring game the whole time maybe it's going to end up 17 13 okay but then yeah before halftime at that point you've seen Michigan drive the ball in the defense a little bit okay you're behind take a shot like take you have literally the best player in college yeah. football on your team take a shot and didn't do it. And we'll have some sound from Sharon Moore a little later on 
talking about how he was really committed to being aggressive and how he talked about being aggressive with the players and how he was going to live up to it. And he did. And they went mm -hmm. for, what, three, were three, they three times for three, three for three? Three for three now, on fourth downs? Their fourth down attempts were much easier, much um you definitely go for well, those. Yeah, they're on their yes, they're on yeah, the Ohio State yeah. side of the field. But, but here in modern football, here in the year of our Lord 2023, you go forward and forth and want your 46 yard line. That's you, you you do that. That's just come. That's conventional wisdom now is that you go for it, and you especially go for it if you're you talk about if it. you talk about the fact that. And we're going to talk about toughness too. One of the most glaring, you know, Ryan Day loves to talk about toughness. Michigan players were asked uh, about Ohio State's toughness, and uh, we're gonna. I'll just play the soundbite later. That's uh, been sent. We'll see if it when it's ready. Text me when it's ready. Uh, because because that was of super chats. Yeah. So, so let's. A couple of super chats. We have all the Ohio State post sound because of technical issues. Sure. Those sure. All ready to go. Too. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, first super chat that we have here, Ryan Dawes. Sometimes Ryan Day thinks he's coaching the NFL and not at Ohio State. That's interesting. Sometimes Ryan Day thinks he's coaching in the NFL and not in college football, where the NFL, you can win games 20 to 17. And college football, although it's it's much more difficult. And when you have opportunities, especially on the road against Michigan, I think you need to make more of them. And if you do give up, you, know, you don't get on fourth down, Michigan has it on first down at their own, at your 46 or whatever, you have – three quarters to make up for it and to deal with it at that point. So th there is this NFL thing where you just do everything by the book. And you see some of the young, successful NFL coaches are doing things more like college coaches, mm -hmm. and they're making waves. Yep. Next Super Chat. Super, other Super Chat, also from Ryan Dawes. I asked Mark earlier, does Ryan Day have a greater fear of success or failure? Does Ryan Day have a greater fear of success or failure, Tom? That's a good question. Um. I don't want to get into psycho uh, mm -hmm. psychoanalysis uh, at this point. What is he more focused on success or failure against Michigan? I think he's I think he's pretty risk averse. Mm -hmm. How about we put it that way? I think yeah. he's pretty risk averse in big games and big moments. Um, and you know, I, I think there's a, there is a certain point of when you play to win, your team picks that up and. There's a little post hoc ergo propter hoc thing here with, you know, the Michigan Michigan went for it three times and they won. And so therefore mm -hmm. the, their players in the post game say this was all caused by Sharon Moore being aggressive. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, if if Kyle McCord hits Marvin Harrison there, Marvin Harrison runs into the end zone. Does that make Mar Sharon Moore's right. fourth down decisions any more or less viable? No, that was that game was. If you go back to the way we were talking about this game 24 hours ago, it was going to be close, going to be a 60-minute game, and one person, you know, there there is going to be the big mistake, and that was going to be what decided it, and it was just who's going to make the big mistake, and now, now we know the answer. Yeah, and I, I, so before the game, you, you got to make the plays that are available to you, that are mm -hmm. available to be made. Michigan did that throughout this game. Mm -hmm. They did it with play calling. They did it with execution. We'll get into that. Kevin, Super Chat. Super Chat. Uh... Stray Dog, what was the game plan? Play it safe on both sides of the ball and hope for the best? What was the game plan? Play it safe on both sides of the ball and hope for the best. I think there's a little bit of that, especially against Michigan's offense, where you know they're not necessarily all that explosive. So you can afford to, you know, you hope you get them some stops on third downs, which they did. They did. Michigan did not do very well on third mm -hmm. down, but they did enough and they got their fourth downs and sometimes they stayed out of third downs. But they did a really good job controlling the ball controlling the game at that point. And so I, I do think there is some conservative aspect to this. I, as I said to ask Kevin, I'll ask your thoughts on this. Do you think the thought process or the, the plan for any kind of aggression on offense change with that first interception? I think that's a real possibility because you, I think you can come in with a game plan and then, you know, the old Mike Tyson, everyone's got a plan mm -hmm. until they get punched in the face. So how does they get punched in the face real early in the game? And it cost him seven points in a game that was going to be a very, very close game and not a super high scoring game. That game was not going to be 56 52. That game was going to be, you know, I think we said if you get to 30, you win the game. And mm -hmm. Michigan got to 30 and won the game. I, I don't, you know, I think I think that very well could have changed a little bit the uh, the game plan there for Ryan Day that, okay, you know, may, maybe you're a little more, because if you don't make that mistake early, then you're not down seven nothing. Michigan wasn't driving against the Ohio State defense early. 
Michigan, yeah, Michigan got the 30, but Michigan got a seven, was a seven yard yep. drive. I mean, yeah, they got worn down a little bit towards the end of the game, but I think people calling, you know, being irritated at Jim Knowles for being not as aggressive as he was last year may not be remembering how the aggressiveness went last year and what they were yelling about at the end of last year's game. That's you, you don't, you don't get to have it both ways. Well, and you still had when Michigan was supposed to be running the clock out, they mm -hmm. threw the ball. Yeah. They were, they were staying aggressive. Mm -hmm. The halfback option pass from Donovan Edwards. We saw that last year it with Kalal Mullings uh -huh. or the year before they did it again. Like they, they don't care. Yeah. And uh, they came out, they played to win Ohio state. As um, I don't know, did did John Cooper play not to lose? I mean, that at, was at times John John Cooper kind of would ping pong back and forth. Mm -hmm. Where in 1990 he played to win on, and they ran a fourth and one option in their own end and got stopped. And then in 1992 they played to not lose and kicked the field goal and tied. And you know, it's. You're, you're kind of I think there's a little bit of, uh, you know, you date the opposite of your ex, mm -hmm. you know, that that, OK, well, last year we were too far this way. So now we're going to go this way and we're going to we're not going to make the same mistake twice. And make a different mistake. You're going to make a different mistake is, is how it kind of works. Uh, defensively, did they make I mean, there are some missed tackles I, no, in there, but I, I don't think they were it, 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 Ohio State outgained them. Michigan. Yeah. Michigan rushed for four yards per carry. Yeah. They had a couple uh, the uh, I mean, the long four. Alex Orgy had a 20 yarder. Mm -hmm. JJ McCarthy had a 15 yarder. That was another good play, the Alex yeah. Orgy. That was yeah. that you changed that was the first first series out of the second half. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind you're changing, changing doing something yeah. different. Yeah. Blake Corum had the 22 yarder. Mm -hmm. But but I mean so you had one play longer than 20 yards on the ground and through the air they had uh two plays longer than 20 yards. Colson Loveland had a 34 yarder, mm -hmm. Roman Wilson had a 22 yarder and that was it. And this the Ohio State defense, I think, played fine. I would like to go back and rewatch the game and have you know more complete thoughts on it because, as I've mentioned before, where I watch the game, it's a lot of fun. It's not a great place to process everything yeah. that's going on looking through a camera lens. So I, I would like to kind of go back and rewatch or at least take a dive through the box score at the very least and remember what drives happened in what order and all that. But, yeah, I think there's uh, – there's, uh, you know, I, I don't put this – I don't put this one on – Jim Knowles at all. No, you as Ryan Day said in the post game, the team that runs the best and the team that doesn't turn it over wins. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they did neither of those things. So yeah. it's impossible. You can't put this on the on the Ohio State defense. Ohio State's defense gave up four yards per carry. I think Ohio mm -hmm. State's offense was at like three point eight yards per carry. Like yeah. very close, but it's the the turnovers that mm -hmm. killed Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Kevin, super chat. Lots of super chats. Lots of super chats. Adam K. Michigan players just played better than our guys. A Buka drop, missed field goal, bad punts, bad interception. UM had zero drops, zero special team miscues, zero turnovers. That's on the players, not day. The well, that's a good point. The the mistakes on the the players, mm -hmm. uh, the drops, that's on players, not Ryan Day. There, you know what? I mean, that's a good point. Emeka Abuka, but that, that, that was that, that on the first Ibuka drive. Had, Emeka Abuka had one drop. Yeah. That, Two minutes into the game, right? You can the, overcome the last that. Last fifty-eight minutes was not, yeah, but um, that. and that's not the the only mistake. But you know, even something silly that uh, another uh, illegal uh, formation on the punt, which you know didn't, yeah. didn't necessarily really impact anything, but just another the, one the of those things. The attention to detail is just chef kiss just yeah. every week uh, on special teams, and yeah, I mean, you have uh, Jaden Fielding gets the uh, pr practice kick and drills it from whatever 52 yards and then misses the one that's for real. Yeah, it's just... He had plenty of leg on there. Yeah. I'll say that one, but yeah. Uh, yeah. that was wide left. Next Super Chat. Mike, next year, Duluth playoff starts. The game won't matter as much. A one-loss OSU would still get in. Yeah, and I think that's true. I, I think, and, you know, there is... It's not impossible for a one-loss OSU to get in this year. Yeah. I mean, that's three things have to happen. Yeah. Much. And, and we, you know, maybe had the same conversation after last year's mm -hmm. Michigan game and it happened again. And, you know, I know right now in the chat, I can't see the chat. I can guarantee <laughs> you everyone's going, I don't, want I don't want the playoffs. I don't want, you know, this team doesn't deserve it. Yada, yada, yada. I mean, th there are going to be one loss teams in the playoffs. So, uh, and this is a very good Michigan team. This is, as we said before the game, this is, I think the best of the Michigan teams of the last three years. It's interesting, Tony, that playing the best Michigan team of the last three years on the road with clearly not the third best of the Ohio State offenses of the last three years, how much closer the game was this year. I had lots of people in my Twitter mentions after the game, like, like well, uh, I don't know that this game showed you what you're 
thinking yeah. this game showed you. They, they outscored but, the but previous two teams. That's a, that's a whole separate that's a whole separate conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Chat, but Joshua D. Smart needed until season six to make the leap into a league. Day needs to give up play calling and make the jump next season. Kirby Smart took uh, yeah. until season six to make yeah. it into the elite. Wasn't he like one play away from winning a national championship in year two? Um, didn't, didn't Hugh Freeze say something about like it took him forever and it was like, well, actually he was in overtime in the national championship game in year two. Well, and and, and Ryan Day was in the national championship yeah. game in year two. So it's not, you know, I'm not, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just saying the Kirby Smart thing is not quite as I think I remember. You have to win it to be elite, I think is maybe the, the thing yeah. there. And I disagree with that. But if we're saying it took six years to win it, yeah, yeah then clearly Ryan Day still has some time. But continuing to have to learn from these losses when you do the sort of the same thing. Although I will say they threw the ball definitely a lot more of CJ Stroud, but that's because mm -hmm. he's a better quarterback. I was surprised that the running game was so um, not inventive. It, we, we, it stayed between the tackles for most of it. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't see much on the outside. Didn't see much of the Xavier Johnson experience other than like one rush on third and eight, basically. And yeah. he picked up the first down. I thought there was more they were going to do with that two-back stuff. That's why they'd been showing it mm -hmm. for uh, the second half of the season. But they didn't do any of the. Uh, they didn't do any of that. They had a, they had Trevion Henderson and Xavier Johnson in there together one time towards the end. I'm like, okay, well, this is going to be the wheel route. And it wasn't. I will also say this last drive not attacking Josh Wallace yeah. when, and they did with, with Julian Fleming once, but Kyle McCord had him several times and wasn't looking over on this side of the field or over on the right side of the field mm -hmm. to where they had single coverage on Michigan's worst defender. And I, and Will Johnson left the game at some point. He, yeah. He was out, but the, they didn't attack Will John or um, jo uh, Josh, uh, Josh Wallace, Josh Wallace nearly, yeah. nearly enough. Yeah. They moved Sainer still outside. And I think uh, Jaden Burroughs was in the slot. And yeah, that was at that point, Mike Sainer still outside is not as good as yep. uh, as Will, as Mike Sainer still in the slot, and he's certainly not as good as Will Johnson outside. Uh, I believe they said it was like a lower body, like a leg injury or something like that for, Marvin, for Will Johnson. But. Marvin said he's never been double covered as much as he was in this game, yeah. which is even more reason why aren't yeah. you going to someone, other people? Someone else needs to step up. Super Chats. Point. Super Chat. Murphy Serafino addressing the elephant in the room. Fire Ryan Day. Fire well, Ryan Day? So – one thing that was interesting to me was someone came up to me this morning and I have not gone back and looked at this or watched this or read this or whatever it was, but that Bruce Feldman was talking about the fact that, you know, if Ohio state lost this game, that Ryan day would at least maybe take the phone call from Texas A&M, which yeah, I have no idea. Bruce, Bruce Feldman is a uh, respected mm -hmm. enough reporter that I would, you know, that was the first time I thought, okay, maybe there's something to this and you know, you're not going to fire Ryan day, but, you could you could see how you know I, I think the change to the twelve team playoff makes the Ohio State job even better, but you know you you have seen coaches leave to restart their clock somewhere mm -hmm. else that you know everyone in Columbus is tired of Ryan Day whether justified or not. If you go to Texas A and M, you're the shiny exciting new thing. I don't think Texas A&M is as good a job as Ohio State. In, at Ohio State, you have a chance to be the best team in your division, in your league. At Texas A&M, you, you, I mean, you're capped at like the third or fourth best now. You might, you're not the best team in your own state, state in your own right. league now starting next year. You're third best but, in your own region. But, you know, it, if you if you feel like I just need a fresh start, I'm, you know, and, and you know, there's been plenty of uh hostility towards ryan day uh from ohio state people from michigan people so you know like if he made that decision i would understand i don't you know i don't think career-wise that's your best move but you know I, I once bruce feldman put that out there it was kind of like okay so maybe there's at least something to think about there yeah i i don't think you leave ohio state to deal with the texas a&m stuff i think if you're going to leave ohio state if he's going to leave ohio state he's not going to be fired mm -hmm. especially not by an outgoing uh, AD AD, yeah. and you know the, the new president situation, mm -hmm. but um, I thought I've said if he leaves, it would be for the NFL. Yeah. Um, yeah if the Patriots but, job opens, sure, maybe. Kevin. Well, then Thamel came out and said that the candidate, that the name that should be emerging is Mark Stoops of Kentucky. Mark, yeah, Stoops, Mark, of Kentucky. Mark Stoops of Kentucky was asked about it in his post game press conference today. Apparently, I just saw that on Twitter and sort of uh, demurred and chose, you know, sort of talked about, uh, you know. 
his program at Kentucky and all that and didn't say yes or no. Yeah, he, they're just going to enjoy this win over Louisville, which is one of the things that Ohio State oh, had to have happen. Okay, I didn't even realize they won. Yeah. Okay, well, so that's interesting. That's and, one of the things and, that needed yeah. to come off of the advent calendar for mm -hmm. Ohio State's yeah. playoff chances. And that's, okay, so that's interesting. I didn't I didn't know that. It was a touch, 38 31, I believe, something okay. like that. Well, and, you know, I think Mark Stoops would be nuts to leave Kentucky because he has the perfect situation where there's no pressure. But they're getting there's tired no, of him, too. There, You've got, well, you've got some he fans. Has, he has too. a contract. His contract, I'm going to do this off the top of my head, but if they win seven games, his contract oh, automatically rolls over for another year at a good amount of money. And yeah, yeah, they fans care about Kentucky football in the same way that fans care about Ohio State basketball. Like, yeah, yeah I mean, they care, but not, it, you know, it, it's not the first thing people are thinking of when they wake up in the morning. No, and, and but he does have a chance to win in the SEC East now because mm -hmm. of how bad it is, but uh, they're still struggling. Kevin. Super chat, stray dogs. Tight, end killed, tight ends killed Ohio State all game. Michigan forced Chambers to cover the flat. Put Tommy on tight end in the center of the field. No adjustment. A lot of base defense. Yeah, uh, taking advantage of Ohio State's linebackers with Colston Loveland. Yeah, and, and A.J. Barner, And A.J. Barner. Mm -hmm. They both had really good games. And a set, um, on uh, second and third downs especially, just getting to those guys and moving the chains. And Colston Loveland is going to be an NFL tight end. Mm -hmm. And covering him with the linebacker is because we talked about do you put Sonny there like what do you, how do you handle Loveland yeah, yeah because handling him with Tommy Eichenberg is not the right move but mm -hmm. if he's the only linebacker out there although they were going a lot three linebackers mm -hmm. with Cody Simon out there as well who is also not necessarily a coverage guy yep. are we caught up on super chats no 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 no, no. Uh, Dave K. Hey guys, too sad to listen now and relive it. I'll catch up tomorrow. Thanks for all you do. Even Kevin for turning on the camera, shaming trolls in the chat, and making sure the Wi Fi is always top notch. Thank you for that super chat. You're absolutely correct. Especially the third one. Yes. Jordan Kapler, I'm having a really hard time spinning this as Kevin Noon's fault. Can you help me out? Having a hard time, Jordan Kapler, spinning this as Kevin Noon's fault. Can we help him out? Ah, uh, boy. I, I honestly cannot blame this one on Kevin. He, um, um, I mean, go ahead. Where, where, where did things start going wrong? What was the first thing that happened when Ohio State got to the hotel last night? Uh, the Wi-Fi goes. The Wi-Fi wi -Fi goes out. On, on, well, listen, don't. No one likes a buck passer, Kevin. Uh, I mean, it. Sometimes when you get a bad omen. Players, coaches probably sitting in the hotel all last night thinking about, you know, hey, their Wi-Fi went out. I was watching that on my phone walking in to the hotel. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Frank, put this on. Well, you know, the first element that I saw had nothing to do with Kevin. It's the, third, the Thanksgiving game where Sean Gary had like three sacks and a couple of them against Taylor Decker. Uh -huh. So at that point, it was like, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin. Yeah. Uh Bella, sorry. Gloating aside, that was an incredibly stressful, awesome game. Go blue, and I honestly hope somehow OSU makes it in, and we see you again in the net. Michigan fan in the chat. A Michigan, a Michigan fan in the chat with the username Bella, sorry. That is that is some next level. Yeah. S O R R Y. Oh, could be. I, I mean, I was thinking it was just like the name, and it was just like an Ohio State fan being like Jermaine Gonzalez. Like this is a, <laughs> this is a name that we'll give people from the other team. But um, uh, um, and and yeah, I. I, I would watch that football game again. That was that was a, you know, it was funny. I, the last drive where they had the Julian Fleming catch, fumble, review, mm -hmm. and it was close, but he got two feet down, and it was like he it happened. And I said to the person next to me that Ohio State it was it was close, but I think Ohio State was sort of karmically owed that from the mm -hmm. 2019 Fiesta Bowl, and then you had the 2019 Fiesta Bowl ending part part two. I, I mean, boy, that was. And this is not a season over kind of thing, quite the way that that was. Right. It might end up being, but you won't know for another week. Yeah, the um, the, the 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 Denzel Burke non interception interception oh, on, yeah. the, on the, the room. First of all, can we, let's. I just want to say, JJ McCarthy. We said before the game, he needs to be as accurate as he's ever mm -hmm. been. He was fantastic. Oh yeah, no, he had a great he hit game. all yep. of the the, yep. the narrow windows, and we said we haven't seen that from him in, in a while. He was mobile. He was accurate. This was the J.J. McCarthy that I thought I was going to see all season long. Well, I, I think we at one point said, you know, well, you're not going to get 75, 80 yeah. percent completions out of him. 16 for 20, 148 yep. yards, one touchdown, zero picks, 80 percent completion. Yep. And, uh, and, and several a, a runs. couple runs. And, and it was 
you know, four four rushes for 17 yards, but a long of 15. That 15 yarder was a big one. That was one. It was one of the drives in the he, second half. Yeah, he was fantastic. Uh, safe to say, ready for the NFL at this point. So, you know, bon voyage, JJ McCarthy, Kevin Super Chat. Uh, Dean Swint, great week of pre-game, pre-game coverage, trailer, tra- trailer Park Boys. Thank you. Thank you for the Super Chat. I always appreciate that. And then Murphy Serafino with just a blank one, but again, he is not happy with Ryan Day. I'll just yeah, well, say that. some Super Chats with, from some people unhappy with Ryan Day. Yeah, I mean, you lose three in a row. However it happens, it happens, and you – you keep waiting for this to end and you feel like you, you feel, I think Ohio state fans felt pretty good going into this game. I mean, Ohio state felt pretty good going into this game. And then right away you throw the interception, not right away, but early on you throw the interception. You're battling from behind the entire time. A stressful game for everyone watching, except for, I wonder how stressful this was for Michigan fans because it, I'm sure they felt like, well, this is, Kind of like how Ohio State fans and, Ohio, and people who covered Ohio State over the years, like, well, this is how it feels like when you're leading against your rival because this happens every year. So this is a normal feeling. I'm assuming this is kind of a normal feeling for Michigan fans because, yeah, uh, of course it's going to be tight, but we're winning and well, it'll it'll all work out in the end. Well, and Michigan Michigan responded every time Ohio yeah. State scored. Ohio State, I don't think, ever had the ball after Michigan scored the first time. I don't think Ohio State ever had the ball with with you know, tired or the lead. So, you know, that's if you, if you never have the ball with the lead, it is hard to win a football game. Yeah, they, they almost did it, but they, but they didn't. And, and I will say that last drive, I didn't feel like it was over. Like they had no chance. Like I have felt with oh, no. CJ Stroud mm-hmm. in years past where mm-hmm. it's like, it, it just doesn't happen. And maybe because, you know, at that time there maybe like 10 down or something, but on final drives, We've seen it from Kyle McCord, but we've also seen how effective Marvin Harrison is mm-hmm. and how explosive this offense can be at times. So I didn't ever feel like it was over until that final interception. Well, it just it felt that whole drive as they're going down when they get down to Michigan territory, it was like, okay, you are now in, you can throw the ball up in the air and Marvin Harrison can do something super yep. crazy in the end zone and win the game territory. You know, you were within that range and you know, very much like that 2019 Fiesta Bowl where they got the ball back. They started, they got down the field. They got into Clemson territory. They were thrown into the end zone on that one. And like, nope, just that one, that one mistake. Kevin, Super Chat. Super Chat, Mike Smith. Day needs to open up. This conservative approach is routinely hurting this team, playing not to lose against Michigan and playing Playing to win against Michigan State isn't a winning formula. <laughs> yes, the conservative nature of Ryan Day playing not to lose against Michigan and playing to win against Michigan State and that ilk is um, – I, I would agree with that. And if you can be aggressive against bad teams, that, that tells me nothing. Right. And and I'm at the point with him where telling me you're going to be more aggressive doesn't mean anything to me. Like, I, mm-hmm. fool, I, I, don't know, I don't know what fool me – number we're on but it's higher than three or four so and and i think the majority of ohio state fans right now if you sim to ohio state being 11 and 0 next year that's where they're going to start caring about literally anything next year (laughs) yeah and it's going to be a fun year next year with everything going on but i i do wonder what the the mood with uh having kyle accord back obviously there he's going to need to prove something and it's not more than just this bowl. I mean, at this point, he would need to win a national championship this year to win over the fan base again, I think. Because I, w- walking to the, the post game, I had somebody say, I'm going to start a GoFundMe, and we're going to send Kyle McCord anywhere he wants to go. <laughs> and that was just you know the attitude of one person. But it's a lot to put on the quarterback. But the, you are the quarterback, so that is what gets put on you. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, see, how, many, how many we got? We're good? Okay, we're caught up. So let's get to – what what Ohio State post game do we have? Do we just want to do, we do have like all of them. well like nine minutes. okay let's okay let's let's start with the Ryan Day post game we we have a ton of stuff still to come lots of interviews with players and coaches Michigan players and coaches as well but let's let's hear a little bit from Ryan Day because I'm interested to kind of hear what he had to say. You guys got some rhythm. Go- you guys got some rhythm going on offense and then whatever it is that last play. Uh, 
What were you looking for there? Kyle got hit. It looked like it was pretty long. Yeah, they were in his own coverage, and uh, you know we needed a touchdown there. I think you know right inside of 30 seconds, and um, you know they were in a deep coverage there. So um, you know, I'm not sure even if he had gotten hit, you know what would have happened there. But um, you know, you know I, that looked like he got hit, and then and then um, you know they made a nice play. Uh, hard to describe. Yeah, um, you know, just sick. The fact that you know, um, you know, we came up short in this game. You worked your whole whole year for it, and, um, and we came up short. So, um, yeah. Right next door, Larry Lage, KP. Can you explain your thinking early on, uh, not going up for it on fourth down, and at the end of the first half, um, not trying to pick up the first down, um, you know, before the clock ran down. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I felt like. At 52 yards, um, it was worth a field goal there. If you if you don't get it on, I think it was what fourth and two, fourth and three, somewhere in there, uh, you had no points. And you know, I felt like it was it was worth the opportunity to kick the field goal at least. If we come up short there, then it's a turnover on down. So I felt like that was the right move. And then early in the game, around midfield, um, just don't want to give them any momentum. Felt like we could pin them down and play defense. I thought we were playing pretty good early on. Over to the right, Austin Ward, the podcast. Looks like you went out to get more of an explanation on the. Yeah, I, I was told that um, it was called on the field a touchdown, and because of that, um, uh, you know, it was it was upheld. Um, you know, I didn't quite understand exactly how that was, but um, but that's what they said. Uh, Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. Yeah, just uh, they, they, they um, did a nice job running the ball, and you know we ended up hanging on at the end, give it, giving our offense a chance to win, but uh, too much time off the clock there. You know we got to get a stop and get off the field. Clay Hall, WSYX. How would you rate Kyle's performance? I mean, eighteen to thirty, almost three hundred yards. The decision making. I mean. Yeah, in, in this game, you, you got to win the rushing yards and you got to win the turnover battle. And we did neither of those things. So, um, you know, um, if, if we're not, that's not going to happen. We're not going to win this game. Uh, uh, Dan, did you have your Dan Letzel yeah. Yahoo? Brian, um, your team played post this is a huge stage, so much going on. What do you tell? What did you tell them? You want to share after it was a game? Yeah, I, I try to keep, um, you know, uh, what we talk about in the locker room to ourselves. Uh, yeah. Or, all right, oh. so uh, so we're back. Yeah, that was Ryan Day. Uh, he did. He had to address the the fourth down situation, going for a field goal in the second quarter, three different times. Yeah, and he had to clarify for somebody who uh, didn't understand why. Like, but why didn't? Well, you know, why did yeah. you do that? And he's like, because if you go for it on fourth down and you don't get it. The other team gets the ball. Yeah, but how much time was left? It wasn't like thirty seconds. Yeah, left? it was like thirty-one and, seconds. Of the left. Yeah, I mean, and is Michigan gonna no, swing not. it downfield? Michigan's gonna take their lead in the right. locker room. Exactly. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't view that as a reason not to do it. Like, it's fine, it's defensible, but you don't, you don't get to talk about how you're gonna be super duper aggressive yeah. if you're gonna do that. Right, Kevin, and, and he did say I would do it at any point in the game. It wasn't just because they were running out in half, and again, and I disagree with that. I, I think doing it at half is the least defensible time to do it <laughs> because Michigan's like, not going to do anything if you yeah, don't get it. Like right, they're going to have right, to yeah. get 30 or 40 yards. Yeah. In, you're not, you're not, 25 you're, not seconds. you're not turning the ball over them in good field position in the time yeah. where they're going to do it. So that makes it the least defensible time. To Kevin do it. super chat. I'm going to just say Gary K. I don't want to disrespect the man by mispronouncing his last name as a Michigan fan watching this game was very stressful, happy for the win, but not happy with his headache. Now much respect for OSU. Hopefully OSU gets a dub in the bowl game. Go big 10. Well, see now, Michigan fans are rooting on Ohio State, and uh, Michigan fans are keeping pitying up. Ohio yes. State. They're there, just, slugger. Yeah, just just you know, muscle them on the head. You know, keep your head up. One day you'll get there, and you'll be with everybody else at the big table. You can stay at the kitty table now, but uh, yeah, at least it was stressful for Michigan fans. It was stressful for Ohio State fans. At least, at least the the stress was there. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure how many Ohio State fans are still watching, but we do. We do appreciate everybody tuning in for as long as you have. Kevin, Super Chat, are we good? Slant to Marv, not screen, blindly throw in the slant. Yeah, that, I mean, and Kyle talked about that, and that to me looked like an RPO where he was throwing it as soon as he didn't hand it off. And that's oh, basically yeah, yeah, what yeah. he did. Okay, the, okay. Interception. the, pick, the pick in the first half. Yeah, okay. and, and he said he read the linebacker, and he never saw the defender. And mm -hmm. so that's 
you I, we said it at the, to start the show you can't you can't do that you can't operate like that you can't just blindly you you can sometimes just blindly throw to marv yeah but not on a slant like that where the defender is not going to be that far and it's not a 50 50 ball it's a slant you know right, so right uh will johnson jumped it as soon as the as soon as the ball didn't go to the running back he jumped it and made a great play on that one and kyle never saw him uh, Gary K again. No, no disrespect. Just hate the SEC. No disrespect. <laughs> just hate the SEC. Well, well is that is, is Gary a Michigan fan? No, he's an yeah, Ohio State fan. No, no, he's a, oh. he's a Michigan fan. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so he's not. He's not one of the Michigan fans who's in favor of joining the SEC. No. I did it greatly enjoy the they have the pregame video that I think is narrated by James Earl Jones where you know he gravely intones that this is the greatest university in the world. And there is a line in there, and this is a video that they've played for years yeah. and years and years. Proud members of the Big Ten Conference. There were lots of cheers throughout the video. <laughs> that was like tumbleweeds really? on oh, the proud members of the Big Ten Conference line. I thought that was I, I think I laughed out loud when when because I I have not seen that video in a while, obviously, and uh, yeah, that was that was a pretty good uh, pretty Tom, good laugh. Do you want to know where there were also a lot of cheers? Up in the press box when good things happen for Michigan. Really, surprise, surprise, surprise. The the there is something about the state of Michigan and the media where. Michigan State media is generally good for one go green, go white at Big Ten Media Days every year. And it's like, I don't think you understand what this atmosphere is supposed to be. You, you so. missed there's a, there's another show going on towards uh, midfield, or not midfield, but about 20 yards over there with a screaming man doing his postgame show, a little screaming man doing his postgame show. Uh, so um, it's quite obnoxious. Can, Kevin, I get, can I guess the name of the screaming man? Not on air. <laughs> David Greenshield, on the McCord second INT, it did appear that Henderson – would have had a good game. Was that your? Was, is that what you saw? Yeah, um, I have not seen it since because I, I was packing up once that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I was starting to pack up so we could get down there. There were there were people ro running free throughout the game, mm -hmm. and so I'm going to assume there were people running free on that one. And uh, Henderson or Harrison, I think that was intended for Marv on that one. It was yes, but again. When there are two guys covering Marv, somebody else is going to be open-ish, mm -hmm. and you know now Kyle McCord is going to have to op operate without that security blanket next yeah. next yeah. year. Yep, and yeah, maybe like, this year. Yeah, yep. Okay, so we're caught up. So, do we want to hear from? Uh, do you want to hear from Kyle? Do you want to hear from Marv? Who do we want to hear from next? Well, I want to hear uh, from Roman Wilson. Okay, let's let's let you hear a little bit from Roman Wilson. And I believe I was cutting this in an enormous hurry, and I believe I cut the question at the front because please pay attention to the question, and please pay. Speaking, you know, Will Johnson jumping the route. Roman Wilson jumps this question. He could not wait to answer this question. Uh, Ohio State fans who are. Uh, on the like blood blood pressure medication, you may want to just mute your computer for the next minute or so. Uh, here is Roman Wilson on uh, Ohio State and Ohio State's toughness this year. For all of you, Ohio State made a big deal this year about being more physical. Did you get a sense no, that they were more physical? Definitely not. I mean, like I told the receivers this whole week, like you got guys back there. Like <clears throat> this is the thing that I thought too. Like guys who you want to put on like the Louis V, like the thousand dollar outfit. Like, you want to act hard, but when we're out there, like, they're not hard. Like, I see the film, like, you're not tough. Like, and I don't think I'm the toughest guy in the world, but, you know, I'm out there. I'm getting physical. Like, I don't think they wanted it like how I wanted it. You guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah I said it. <laughs> All right, so that was Roman Wilson. He could not wait to answer that question. And, you know, this is one of these things where, you know, I tweeted with a minute left in the game. You know, it's amazing how much narratively is going to swing on what happens in the next minute. Yep. If Kyle McCord makes a better throw there or throws to a different guy there, does that mean that Ohio State is tough? Because Ohio State had to drive where they mashed Michigan's faces in going yeah. down, the, down the field. I'm sure that, you know, that has sort of become the narrative around this Ohio State team. Ohio State, Michigan did not run over Ohio State. Michigan has not run over Ohio State for the last two years. They had... You know, a couple times they caught Ohio State in a cover zero last year. But before that, Michigan was not running the ball over Ohio State. Michigan ran the ball four yards a carry this year. And, you know, had a couple 20-yarders where you take those out and then you're running for three yards a carry. And so yeah, the toughness thing, like, 
like whatever it's the narrative it's the it, it is what it is um but it was it was interesting to me that 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 was the like couldn't wait to drag that's that is marvin harrison has like designer stuff that he yeah. wears when he walks into the stadium that's i'm sure that's, what that was referencing I, I think roman wilson got a bunch of attention early on for having like 10 catches in four or five games and he was getting a lot of attention and marvin harrison continues to do what he does and, and take away a lot of the attention for the big 10 wide receivers and to me that that just I think that has rubbed him the wrong. That has rubbed Roman Wilson the wrong way throughout the season in terms of, you know, I am also a good receiver. I am also productive, but I mean, there are receivers with better numbers than Marvin Harrison who are not getting nearly the, the attention as Marvin Harrison. So, mm-hmm. just I think, um, you know, I, I, it doesn't surprise me that somebody would take a shot yeah. at, at Marvin. All right, and and, well, and, and really, I, I think you're going to see the, continue to see that with NIL and, and mm-hmm. this era. So while we have all the Ohio State fans angry and all the Michigan fans like tenting their fingers and gi- and, and giggling, I want to uh, let you guys hear from uh, Sharon Moore. And I think this is labeled Sharon Moore on toughness. I really should be Sharon Moore on aggressiveness because he was asked about, you know, the fact that he had told the guys we're going to be aggressive. We're really going to go for it. And they were three for three on fourth down. So let's let you hear for, uh, just for a minute for, uh, from Sharon Moore. Sharon, it was billed as one of the biggest games in college football history, and yet your message was you're not going to be scared, you're going to be aggressive, attacking, play calling. Uh, How do you reconcile that mentality instead of all the tension about the biggest game ever? I mean, it goes back to the kids, how they prepare, how they attack things, and how they work. Um, So I'd be doing them a disservice if I try to be conservative when they're going out there running 150s in the summer, blood, sweat, and tears, working their tails off in the weight room, doing everything they can. They put the trust in uh, me as a play caller on offense to be aggressive in these games. Um, that's what they want, so that's what we gave them. All right, so that was Sharon Moore. And, you know, I mean, that was a talk the talk versus walk the walk thing in terms of being aggressive and playing to win and all that kind of can, stuff. Can I ask you, is it, is it easier to be aggressive if you are the interim guy and you 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 can take the swings? It, it, although I think there's also a you don't want to lose this game, and that's something we talked about before the game in terms of the pressure. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of pressure on Sharon Moore. You can't. You are not the head coach. You can't lose this for the team. That right. sort of thing. And that was never the mindset. It was never no. about losing the game. It was always about what are we going to do to win the game. And lo and behold. You win the game with that kind of mindset, that kind of attitude, that kind of approach, and that kind of play calling. Yeah, I I think when you're, you know, I don't know that Michigan is playing with house money, but Michigan was certainly playing with daddy's money. Well, Michigan was playing with, um, you know, they they have to win this year. Like they they have to win this year, and you know, the 2024 yeah. Michigan conversation is a whole separate conversation that we'll have at some point, but. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, Blake Corum talked about this being his last game in Michigan Stadium. I think there might be people who this was their last game in Michigan Stadium and they don't know it yet. But when you are have the we're pushing all our chips in on 2023, which is very clearly what Michigan has done, you're going to play to win. You're not going to you're not going to play like, oh, boy, I don't I hope nothing bad happens. Like you got to push them in and yeah. you got to you, you got you to believe in your players yeah. and you got to you got to yeah. push them in and win. Yeah. I have a super chat, and I have a request from people of saying Ohio State fans who don't want to hear as much Michigan. Well, okay. I'm just, I'm just saying. We, we we go where the story is. That's that's Matthew, kind of the story. Matthew Mark, some of Dave's past concepts require NFL level of accuracy. Got to let the receivers create space and make it easier for a college quarterback. Yeah, that's interesting. The the Ryan Day passing concepts require uh, NFL level of accuracy from the quarterback. And sometimes Kyle McCord is there, sometimes he's not. And the problem with that is you're calling it regardless and you never know which Kyle McCord you're going to get. And the first half, he was the the shaky Kyle McCord, the Kyle McCord that needs a little while to get going. And strangely enough, he was on the sideline for about a half an hour in like real time after a long like seven-minute drive for Michigan in the first quarter to second quarter. Mm-hmm. And then he comes out and he lights it up like nine for nine or whatever. It took that opportunity for him to get called basically on the sideline to warm up on the field. But also, you do have guys running open because of these concepts. You don't need to be super accurate. You right. just need to be in the area. You need 
to make the throws catchable instead of down at the ankles mm-hmm. or over there. Yeah. Like we're not, you don't need to be CJ Stroud. You just need to be better than what Kyle McCord was today on, on mm-hmm. many of these throws. Yeah. And I think there are some, I, again, I would really like to go back and watch the game again to know, to see where he may be missed guys. I had a couple times that someone said, you know, Oh man, Emeka, Emeka was wide yeah. open on that one. And, and, I am the, because the way I am shooting a football game, I am shooting photos of where the football is going. So I'm not looking through a camera lens, and I don't I don't have even the uh, good view from the stands, let alone the good view from the all 22. And but, the thing is, if Marvin is your first progression, you're going to assume like I've got confidence in him mm-hmm. that I'm going to go ahead and throw it. But with all of the bracketing that they were doing, it I think you need to dial some stuff up for somebody else. And that's what I was mm-hmm. saying earlier about that final drive. When you have no safety help for Julian on Julian Fleming with Josh Wallace, like that is an opportunity to make some plays, and they only yeah. attacked him once on the, yeah. the in route that yeah. uh, Fleming fumbled. I, I think there's more there, and they left a lot out there in, in yeah. terms of whether it's Kyle McCord not making the, the proper progression or just choosing to throw to Marv. Mm-hmm. But we've seen that throughout the season where he locks on to Marv, and if you're going to lock on to anybody, fine. You've got other guys. Everybody running routes at Ohio State is talented, and they can make plays, but you have to give them an opportunity. Yeah, and you know, if Marv is doubled, someone is going to be singled. Like every, probably just about everyone else is going to be singled, yeah. and someone is not. The Michigan secondary is good. They're fine. They're not. This is not the greatest secondary in the history of football, no. and I, I think that that you're going to have someone who is open or where there's a window and whatever and it does feel like he, he you know when you have when you have a guy who is a someone you've played with since high school and you obviously have a great personal connection right. with but b also the greatest you know the best player in college football right now I, I can understand why you would look at him and go hey i should throw him the football he's that's that's my first option i i get it believe me i get it but yeah, you, there you gotta move through your progressions, and he has he has at times done that, but it does feel like there's good Kyle McCord and other Kyle McCord. Okay, we got some starred questions. Um, let, let, let's either hear from Marv or from Kyle. Kyle, let's let's hear from Kyle because he talked about uh, what he was seeing out there on on the interceptions, and also what the locker room was like. You, you work all year for this, and you end up like this. We'll, we'll open up uh, Dylan Davis, Delaware Gazette. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, the corner made a good play on the ball. He jumped inside on the slant. Um, so my eyes were on the, the linebacker and uh, pulled the ball and to go throw it to Marvin. He just jumped it. Uh, but if I could have it back, obviously, probably just want to burn that one in the ground and uh, live to see the next play because uh, we put our defense in a tough situation there. But, um, yeah. Over to the left, Austin Ward, the podcast. Now, how would you describe what it's like to be in that locker room? Last 10 minutes after coming out short. It hurts. I mean, that's really the only word for it. Um, you know, to, to work uh, that hard for, you know, that opportunity and just to come up a few plays short hurts. And, you know, there's no no way around that. Um, you know, so it's it's a tough feeling. Uh, Tim May? Yeah. Tim May um, podcast? Kyle, at, um, the last possession, were you having a, like a little bit of thoughts of Notre Dame? I mean, here you go again and stuff. Y'all got down the field, a little square into. You and Fleming was ruled to catch. Mm-hmm. Whatever. And then on the last play, just take us through that, you know, from your vantage point. Yeah, so defense got us the ball back, uh, down six with about a minute to go. Uh, no timeouts, so we knew uh, we had to get the ball moving. Um, start off with a good completion of Marvin on the sideline, uh, and then obviously Julian's play with uh, Mecca with a great recovery. And uh, obviously in that situation, um, you know, they knew uh, we were, were going to have to take a shot down the field to, to get the – the ball moving, um, and then uh, looked like they played uh, cover two of the boundary there to Julian, and then so I went back to Marvin, kind of got hit as I threw, didn't uh, obviously get uh, as much as uh, on the ball as I wanted to, and you know they made a play. That drive you y'all wrote were basically the last uh, what six eight plays were runs. Did you did you figure y'all kind of had something going now? I mean, what, what was that what was that drive like? Wait, which drive? 
the one where y'all drove and I think you ran the ball like eight times. Oh, eight straight times. Yeah, yeah the one that scored. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that drive was started with the sack and started second and 14 behind the chains. And then Marvin made a good play, got the first down. Uh, and then I think we just called straight runs after that. The O-line did a great job of moving them. Uh, Trey and Chip uh, obviously did a great job of uh, pushing the ball. And then to cap it off with a touchdown there, that was good. Um, I think that was uh, obviously one of the better drives we had in the game uh, to be able to run the ball like that. Uh, Andy Backstrom, Letterman Row. I don't know. The game just ended, obviously. I'm trying to think through everything. But where can you guys go from here? Are you a leader of this team? What do you say to your guys? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, to be honest, it really aren't a lot of words to, to say in a moment like this. You know, it's one of those games where you put everything in um, and, you know, it hurts to, to come up short. Uh, but we'll regroup tomorrow, um, you know, watch the film, obviously, make the, the corrections on it. But, you know, the, the worst part is that, you know, we kind of have to sit back now and see how everything shakes out. Uh, it's out of our control. Um, you know, but I, I know like last year, you know, we got a second chance at life there getting in the playoff and, you know, we came uh, ready to play and motivated. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. Like I said, the worst part is that it's out of our control. Uh, play hall. You know, now they have to sit back and watch other teams mm -hmm. when you have, I'm sure they have no desire to watch any football right now. They're yeah. just, they're going to go and uh, just kind of lick their wounds at this point and want nothing to do with anything. Yeah, and I think, you know, I mean, they do have a path to the playoff, and we'll probably, we're probably going to have to do a playoff show on Tuesday. Yay. Uh, the, there is a path to the playoff, and, you know, Georgia beats Alabama, and so Alabama's out, and, uh, you know, one of the Pac-12 teams wins, so they're in, but the other one is out. If Florida State loses to Louisville, then they're out. If Texas loses to Oklahoma, they're out. You know, you probably only need – you know, if, if Alabama loses, uh, the Pac-12. You know, the GS. If Alabama loses, they're, they're only the Pac-14 right now. The Pac-12. No, I mean next week, not. The, BYU needs to beat Oklahoma. Well, they don't. Oklahoma State. Oklahoma. You State. don't really want Oklahoma State yeah, in the Big Twelve cha no. championship. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And if and if. So you'd rather have Oklahoma yeah. in there to face Texas. So you yeah. need BYU. To win preferably yeah, yeah, against okay. Oklahoma so we're State trying to live in, we're, we're trying to live in the land of reality. But so. I, last I saw it was seven six BYU before we started, so I don't know what it is yeah. now. It's probably but yeah, you know there is a there is a plausible path, and you know last year I think Ohio State fans were probably maybe even more dejected mm -hmm. after this game than uh, than they are right now, and then you know a week so a week a week later. You know, one of the uh, most uh, happiest audience live shows yeah, we've ever was. done was after Utah beat uh, USC in the Pac-12 championship game. So you know, see so see where it plays out. I think I think this is one of these times when the lesson you should have learned from previous years is. Uh, don't make like final statements right now. Yeah. Because people probably made some final statements after the Michigan game last year, and then you know Noah Ruggles is lining up to kick a field goal to send the national championship game at uh, you know eleven fifty nine on New Year's Eve. I, I do wonder, and yes, right now the the wounds are are too new, but that team last year you had the offense to contend with anybody. This mm -hmm. year I don't know that you have the offense to contend with anybody, which maybe changes the math on. Not necessarily the excitement level, but the the anticipation of the possibility. Well, you know, you put these two teams on a field again, and what's the what's the point spread on a neutral field? Um, three, pick them. I mean, three are around is, there. Probably. This is not an unwinnable game no. by any means, especially in a neutral field yeah. and in a climate controlled. Can you imagine Ohio State Michigan playing in the Rose Bowl? I that certainly be, can. That would be the most like home what? jerseys what oh man stop stop um no no i mean if if you you could you could potentially have that i mean ohio state i think i don't think ohio state matches up well with georgia this year you're telling me washington is not beatable you're no. telling me florida state's not beatable i mean i i think you know if you're if, if you're a Ohio State, and you're thinking you're probably getting Georgia again because you're probably number four. So I don't know how that would go, but I did not think that was going to go great last year. And then it was. And for the Michigan, not, fa not yeah, and for the Michigan fans that are watching right now, we should probably just fast forward <laughs> to Oregon and Georgia, honestly, yeah, for the yeah. championship game. Yeah. I'm just, I think that's what it's going to be. Could be, yeah. Kevin. Uh, 
Um, we do have a super chat as the computer is getting really cold and we're under 30%. Um, <laughs> find it. Sorry. Oh, we have a couple. Uh, Silas Copeland. Al McCord is underdeveloped and bad to work in the pocket. And Ryan Day has undervalued special teams and clock management. Uh, those are his blind spots in big games. Well, um, the... Okay, so everybody heard that. Kyle McCord, underdeveloped, poor foot, footwork. Ryan Day has undervalued special teams and clock management, game management. The special teams and game management, and this all goes into Ryan Day continuing to call plays. I wonder if next year is when Ryan – or if perhaps if there's a bowl game and no playoffs, mm -hmm. does Ryan Day hand off the, the play calling? Why not let Brian Hartline you do it? You have to. You have to. It's, it's, and yeah. – and, and that would allow him to spend more time on special teams because at some point you need to make James Laurinaitis a full-time assistant coach. Yeah. And you can maybe kill some birds with just one big stone there. Yeah. The the special teams thing is like not working at all. Like that's just not working at all. And there's nothing to the special teams. Well, there's nothing beneficial. Well, the, the, at what point during the special teams, when the special teams were on the field, did you think, I bet they're about to do something cool? No. Like, you know, hey, maybe they have this cool field goal, fake field goal drawn up. Hey, maybe they have this cool fake punt drawn up. Hey, maybe they've got a punt block drawn up. Hey, and it's just punt, fair catch, punt. It, it's the pickleball of football. It's yeah. It, it and there's always just the one stupid thing. Ohio State had one penalty all day. Was it on offense? No. Was it on defense? No. It was on special teams because it couldn't line up correctly. Yeah. Like, the attention to detail there is just uh, just abysmal, yeah. and you know. I know Urban Meyer very famously never wanted to fire a football coach. And sometimes coaches took lateral moves from being Ohio State's offensive coordinator to Minnesota's offensive line coach. This is a choice that lots of people would make. Hey. It's not like, okay, it, it's time to grow up and run. You know, you got you to run the company like a, like a business. It's time, to, it's time to have some tough conversations. Kevin? A uh, couple of super chats from Mike Smith. First one to punch through my fingers freezing mccord has had big moments like notre dame but he misses wide open guys too much he almost also almost got a buka killed he needs to get better or it's going to keep holding this team back just far too inconsistent well and, and kyle mccord needs to get better with the super chat he nearly got a mecca buka killed has missed some wide open dudes and we've said that and the problem is you never know which comic cords you're going to get from throw to throw. Now there are times where he's firing, like I said, nine for nine at one point, and it looks like it should look, but then on a third and three or whatever, it's thrown to the ground and it looks like it used to look with JT Barrett and, and Braxton Miller with the accuracy, but you don't have that same running ability that can make up for it on mm -hmm. third down where you can escape and do things. You should get better in your second year of starting. That yep. is part of the plan. But also, and this is something we said earlier in the season, the job needs to be wide open. Yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be an open competition because Kyle McCord is not, you know, this is not C.J. Stroud going into a second year where right. it's like, well, you know, this team has problems and that guy is not one of them. This team has this team has a lot of issues it's got to work through, and quarterback play is not where it needs to be. So, I, I would handicap Kyle McCord as the favorite to yes, win the sure. quarterback job next year, but I think that's got to be an open quarterback job because you're, you know, right now you're not getting what you need, so you got to find who can give you what you need. And and really, he's thrown for over 3,000 yards, like 22, 23 touchdowns, six interceptions. By all accounts, very good, uh -huh. but yeah. the expectations are, uh, well, forget the expectations. You see the results, yeah. and the numbers look good. We say that every week. Yeah, there are some bad moments, but if you look at the numbers, he's still completing like 65% of his passes, 230 yards or whatever. But in this one, two interceptions, obviously you can't have that. And almost as costly, just the missed throws uh, to mm. open receivers and not seeing the open receivers, yeah. I think is another issue. I do think fun, losing Marv will force him to grow because you can't just w focus on that guy. Yeah. Now – you lose Marv, you lose Kate Stover, you lose Xavier Johnson, possibly Julian Fleming, possibly probably Emeka yeah. Abuka. So you are going to be – you. who do you rely on? Carnell Tate, I don't think, played in this game. I, I was going to say, I don't think I saw him. I so, was surprised to not see Tate because I think Carnell Tate against Josh Wallace is a matchup that I would have looked at and thought mm – -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I think from the Ohio State perspective, that's one you would have liked to see. I don't know why you wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Kevin? Super chat. 
why after we watched Maryland abuse Michigan with a short uh, passing game, it wasn't used more. He had a play for the first goal. Something. He had a had a play for the first field goal where the DP switched left switched and Julian was left wide open to the corner. Yeah, like like we've said, there have been guys running free. Julian Fleming, one of those. Now, again, guys may be running free, but if they're the third read, it doesn't matter because you're not going to get there unless the other two reads are covered, you know, or you're not going to force it in there. So if somebody's read three of the progression, number three in the progression or number four in the progression, and they're running free, the quarterback is never going to see them unless he's, you know, not throwing to the first two guys. So a lot of that stuff is just luck of the draw. And, and really, I think some quarterbacks can – see the field, the spatial awareness that some guys have mm -hmm. where you can just tell areas that are free and, and areas where guys should be and aren't. And maybe you can build on that after a full year of starting. Right now, Ohio State doesn't have that at quarterback. No, not yet. And, you know, the, the second year for Kyle McCord could look substantially mm -hmm. different, substantially better. We, we won't know until you get into, you know, August, September next year. So – We'll uh, we'll see. Uh, do we? Did you want to hear from? Um, oh yeah, let's hear. Let's hear from uh, JJ McCarthy. He was asked sort of about the uh, you know he gesturing vaguely. Uh, does this game sort of validate the last couple of years that you know that that okay some of some of the other stuff that may have been going on? Who's to say? Uh, you know, maybe not going on now. Does this sort of validate the last couple of years of Michigan's teams in addition to this one? And you'll hear this is a couple of minutes. There's some interesting stuff on a couple of different topics, but it starts with that. There's been a lot of talk, and especially on, on fans of the other team's side. The last two times we beat these guys, it was it had so, something to do with, with something other than you guys. What do you think you guys proved in that regard today? You know, I, I didn't think we. Uh, proved any of those guys wrong or, you know, that was our intention. We proved ourselves right. We know who we are as a team. We know all the work that we put in, and we just wanted to go out there and display it for the world to see. And, you know, obviously extremely happy with the way we did it. Front row, right, Eric? Rod and JJ, it's three years in a row now you beat the Buckeyes. Can you just speak to the emotion of what you guys are going through right now, just the, what you're feeling and, and the success you guys have had the last couple of years? Um, I really can't put into words how I'm feeling. Um, just being it, being a three-peat and being from Ohio, it feels great. Um, especially them guys not recruiting me when I was coming out of high school. Um, just being able to beat them and, and get back, get the get back on them feels so good. I would say, you know, obviously I have a personal story with that. But, um, you know, it's just a blessing in disguise because this university is the best university in the world. And I'm so happy to be a part of it, so happy to be a part of this team. You know, love, love every single one of these guys and happy we did it out there today. Rod, you've kind of talked about your emotion with that last play, but I was, I'm curious for Blake and JJ, when you watch Rod make that play really seal the victory, what was going through your guys' mind? Was there nerves before it? What was the emotion like afterwards? Uh, for me, you know, I wanted to, for me personally, I wanted to get that first down so bad so we could, you know, take a D and get in the victory formation, the best formation in, in football. But I knew my defense, you know, I knew when we kicked the field goal and the defense had to go back out there, I knew someone was going to make a play. You know, because, you know, you, you practice like you play, and we practice hard, man. And so, uh, you know, seeing Rod out there get that pick, um, it just brought joy to my heart, you know, because I, I knew, you know, I knew he was ready. I knew he was ready for the moment, and when the opportunity came, he took advantage of it, and, uh, you know, he did his thing. So, uh, you know, I, I knew the defense was going to come, come through for us. Yeah, same thing. I, I have so much trust in that defense. Obviously, we see them every single day, so I know how good they are. Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, JJ McCarthy, for those uh, kind words. What did he say? Uh, just, I, I thought his answer on the, you know, validating previous yeah. seasons thing was, was, it was a very mature answer. And it was basically, you know, people can think whatever they want to think. This was more about us showing that, you know, to us that we, you yeah. know, the work that we put in, you know, and, and, you know, everyone puts in work like every, mm -hmm. Every college football team puts out the same video of the winter training and the mat drills and all that kind of stuff. And everyone's running the same things during the summer. But, you know, I mean, 
I, I thought that was a very mature way to uh, to handle that. He he comes across as a very likable kid, and you know I think in terms of your well, I'm just kidding. Not not everyone around me may agree, but he I think he you know he is someone who's going to walk out of Michigan, assuming he's done after this year. He walks out of Michigan with the legacy of part of three wins of Ohio mm-hmm. against Ohio State, started two wins against Ohio State. Three Big Ten championships. Let's not kid ourselves about what's going to happen in Indianapolis right. and Indianapolis next week. Oh, I thought three you Big Ten, three Big Ten, or three Big Ten champions, three college football playoff appearances, and you know, and then you see where it goes from there. But you know, he, you know, for all the conversation about the JJ McCarthy Kyle McCord, you know, mm-hmm. recruiting thing, the Kyle McCord story is not closed. The JJ McCarthy story may be closed in a few weeks, but you know. Right now, J.J. McCarthy is up three nothing on Kyle McCord in yeah, terms of well, wins in this game. And in this one, the home yeah. team, the the home favorite, won. Yeah, by yeah. Uh, they they covered, but um, mm-hmm. it was a much different uh, spread and much different uh, number than the last two years. So oh, yeah, it is interesting that he he feels like they had to validate to themselves as if they're. I'm not saying that they had doubts, uh, yeah, but yeah, and I don't want to I don't want to put words in his yeah. mouth. I'm sort of giving you a synopsis of it, but you know, I think that's a whole separate conversation. I don't, I certainly don't think that two straight 20 something point wins with teams that were probably not as good as this year's team against probably better, more explosive yeah. Ohio state teams. I don't think a down to the last minute final 30 yeah. seconds, you know, the other team's quarterback made a dis- bad decision. I don't think that wipes out, the previous two years and you know there's still a lot still to come out on all of that stuff that is a conversation for a different day and a different needed, time when sorry. kevin's computer battery is yeah. not about to die it needed to be a similar win to wipe out the previous yeah, wins, probably, probably especially at home so and, and, and it could have been yeah but it wasn't but, right so that will do it I want to thank you all for tuning in as always uh, please like this video if you have not please unlike it if you have disliked <laughs> it or like it undislike it uh we, we do invite you to find us over at buckeyehuddle.com We would appreciate seeing you guys there. So thank you all for tuning in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. We will talk to you guys later.